Good morning, good people. It's Good Show on Sports F5 Night of the Fan. I'm J.D. Bunkus. Ben Ennis returns for an hour, but still he returns to his old job, which is telling me that I don't have yeah. my microphone on. It's What's like up? riding a bike, man. You just you never forget how to do it. Like I, I just that that's innate for me. It just it felt right to tell you you were speaking to yourself and only hearing yourself. I just wanted you to get comfortable, man. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted I wanted you, you know, you got your jet lag, your time what time is it? Your body time. Six AM? No, it's central time. It is. It's eight AM. Okay, it's uh, it, it, you're you're lagging, you're dragging. You don't know what's going on around no, you. You're feeling a little delusional. Up. That's right. And I just give you things that are comforting for you, like me mm-hmm. not turning on my headset. Good job. And Good I was job, talking buddy. about crypto <laughs> before the show. <laughs> this is genuinely, this is as genuine as it gets for uh, you to get used to your old dig. So what's up, man? So you're back. How was your travel? Uh, it was awesome, frankly. Yeah. Uh well, it's weird because we're in this time where no one does it, so everyone's like, "Tell us your stories." I know. I was like, <laughs> "Yeah." Tell really. us where you've been. <laughs> <laughs> so, hand up. Uh, we had this trip planned for a while when things were really headed in a very positive direction, not just here yeah. but south of the border. Like everything looked good. Like we were going to get mm-hmm. s- close to back to normal, and things went very haywire. I, by the way, people don't know I went to Texas, which is mm-hmm. not. Ex- they're not doing well right now. Mm-hmm. I would say like they got issues. Uh, I don't know anymore. I just I I'm. <laughs> here's what I'm out on is just COVID news. I just yeah, out. You know, well, I just I've too. opted out. And, and so was I until you realize that you're about to be dropped into the COVID petri dish. Then you kind of like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. you got to re up your your news yeah. subscriptions. But yeah, it's basically two states. It's Florida and it's Texas. And we wanted to see my wife's family and her uh-huh. cousins and they all have young children and my kids love seeing them and we hadn't seen jessica's grandmother my wife's mm-hmm. grandmother in years and years and that's years cool. so this was yeah. that that's what the trip was about it wasn't about going you know just for uh, giggles i mean there were plenty of giggles to be had uh but yeah we decided to do it anyways traveling there was absolutely no issue had no problems was there three hours early at the airport unnecessarily so we're yeah. sitting at our gate for two hours obviously. no that's fine i get that i'm i'm the same way i always i i'm i'm just not cool with travel where i tell myself i'm cool no and then i end up i here's here's the thing i either end up sitting at the door of my apartment with all my luggage <laughs> like trying to push the time to yes. leave or I'm yeah. waiting there. So I just yeah. decide I'm going to wait there. Right there. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I, the anxiety I feel is way too high for me to ever just chill. You, have you met people like this that are like my brother's this way? My brother genuinely catches flights. And he, by the way, he's not perfect. He missed one recently. Of course. But he yeah. genuinely ca- will catch flights. Like he shows up there and. It's like we're boarding. They're holding the door for him. Yeah, I do yeah. not, for the life of me, understand my brother-in-law the same way where he's missed flights. I can't, I can't imagine missing a yeah. flight. And it's like, well, yeah. there's 400 bucks down the tubes. Oh, well, get him again next time. Like, what? This is the worst part. This is the worst part. This is the worst part. <laughs> because apparently the airlines are being so uh, welcoming to travelers right now. Yeah. That he ended up just getting a refund. He didn't even lose okay. the money. He should have to lose the money. Oh, yes. Punish, punish those people. No, I'm. Yeah. I'm so exactly you're telling me we're you. showing up like suckers early <laughs> at the airport, and there's no Idiots. fear of reprisal. No. We're just there for we're two idiots. hours, burning through our our headphone batteries and and our phone batteries. Sucks. No, like you, uh, the, the the paranoia, the the guilt, the the anxiety, it just envelops me. So I I just had to show up. But getting there was no problem, honestly. Mm. Even with two young children, and we had the the Nintendo Switch, and they were cool chilling out. And we nice. got there, and it was great. And all the things that we did, we were planning on doing before COVID exploded again in Texas, we didn't do. Didn't go to an Astros game. Mm. Didn't go to NASA. We just kept it local with my wife's family. You didn't go great to trip. NASA. No, he's been to NASA before. My children Still. have been to NASA. I will go to NASA again, but yeah, we didn't. Also, shocking, everywhere I went, people were wearing masks. Even in Houston, in the great state of Texas, people were wearing masks, which I didn't Maybe they're showing respect for you. I don't know what happened there. Um, oh, it was a great trip. Uh, went up to Austin, uh, went in some water. 
uh, drank some some uh, some alcoholic seltzers. It, it was it was a great great trip. Everything was perfect until so we arrived back here Saturday night at Pearson Airport. And if you're reading the news, like all that is so real, it's 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 beyond what you've even read about the horror stories of arriving at Pearson airport right now getting through customs wasn't even the issue they kept us on the airplane for an extra hour so that i guess we weren't jammed into the the customs area with too many people but once we got and i was anticipating that so we threw i threw on a movie for the boys for an hour in the airplane and listen this is not a 747 it was a small airplane i don't even want to hear about this this gives me anxiety but yeah go on uh, I handled it, and we got through customs. I mean, I was behind a family, and a, a, <laughs> there was one moment where I could overhear the customs officer talking to the lady. He said, are you vaccinated? And she said, not yet. And I thought, well, th- this isn't like when you go to the dentist, and you're like, do you do you floss? And you're like, well, I'm working on it. It's <laughs> You're vaccinated or you're not. There's not not yet. You're not getting vaccinated, lady. Like, if, if you're not vaccinated yet and you're traveling, don't think it's happening for you. So get through customs. That was no big deal. Arrive where the baggage is, and there's just bags everywhere. There's bags that have been taken off the carousels because they've been there too long, and who knows where these flights are, where these people are supposed to collect their bags. Our bags don't show up. The 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 death knell is when you see your little your flight number disappear from the screen, and your bags haven't shown up. That's terrifying. We got one bag. <laughs> it's midnight. Our flight al- arrived at nine o'clock. I got two children under six. They're at the screaming. For three hours. They're screaming bloody murder. Like get us home. We're exhausted. So I figure, you know what? What they Here's said the it in that eloquently. That's uh, no, <laughs> no. They were screaming as if they were being bloody murdered. But. Yeah. Uh, I figured we got one bag. It's my wife's clothes. That's the most important thing. We don't have two car seats, which is a bit of an issue. My dad was going to pick us up. I said, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to file out a, a file a, a, a late luggage report and just have the luggage delivered to me later. Um, but to get that late luggage report, I had to get in line. I just wanted the sheet, and I saw the guy holding it. I didn't have any questions, so I did the thing. You know when you go to a restaurant, and, and you just want, like, napkins or something? So you just, you're like, excuse me, like, I just have a quick question to jump in front of Are you line. trying to say you jumped the line you jumped the uh, queue? Wow, I jumped okay. the line. Yeah, okay. And then the guy in the front of the line was like, hey, excuse me, I've been waiting here. And I'm like, well, I just have a quick question. I turn around. It's Nick Nurse. I would cut off Nick Nurse. In the baggage area at Pearson International Airport as he was coming back from, I guess, Vegas Summer League. So I'm, like, kind of, like, dumbfounded. I'm like, it's midnight. My children are screaming at me. I have no luggage. I need to get the hell out of here. I was, I like, turned to goo. I was like, uh, are you sorry, Mr. Nurse? Uh, anyways, I eventually fill out the form. I got one of my two car seats arriving today. I got another piece of luggage that's about to arrive. But other than that, trip was great. You know... There are some questions around Nick Nurse after this past season. Yeah. Hey, was this guy overrated? Hey, can this guy coach a young team? What kind of a leader is this guy if he had Nate Bjorgren as a part of his staff when Nate Bjorgren went to the Pacers and the second he showed up, everyone's take was, this guy's been around human beings before? Yeah. <laughs> like, this guy, this guy doesn't right. seem as though he's ever – he's been living in the Batman cave from yep. number three where he's just down in the darkness – and he doesn't have to act around civilized human beings. The fact that Nick Nurse stepped up for the line yes, and yes. tried to and, – and was holding people accountable. Right. Every question you should have to Nick Nurse, gone. I, I was 100% – Gone. Hey, listen, we used to do who's the bad guy? Hand yeah, up. You. I was the bad guy. <laughs> and he stepped up. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're right. He's, he's the hero we need in these times. Dude, this is going to sound like even more absurd than your story. I just listened to a podcast online. <laughs> I know. I listened to too many podcasts. <laughs> Hold on. Yes. Like, it was just an episode online, or this is a series Buddy. about lines. No. You <laughs> it know what the worst part is? episode five yes. of this podcast series on lines I'm listening to. No. It was, there, it was an episode. It's an episode that just goes through just different studies. And this was actually – there was a three-part podcast series. They needed three parts to discuss the psychology of lines. And for the most part, oh people don't speak up when someone cuts into the line. Oh. They just grumble. It's, 
it's actually just really, really hard for the people who cut into the line because it's viewed as such a horrific thing to do, right? Yeah. Even when they asked people to cut in line for the sake of studies, the people who were doing it were like, we don't want to be involved in the study. We feel like such <laughs> horrific people. It's a heinous crime. It's such a heinous crime. Such a, such a heinous crime. But it's something that's genuinely self-policed by the fact that there's way too much self-disgust that goes into actually doing these things. But no one usually speaks up. Most people are afraid to actually cause conflict because they don't want to end up actually making the situation worse. Here's Nick Nurse, not afraid of conflict, not afraid to mix it up. He sees you. He's a leader. He's, yes, the rest of the cowards, the rest of the sheep in the line. I hope someone listening to this was in the line and was like, you know, I should say something. And his wife was like, say something Charles and he's like, you know, I think I, I think I am gonna say something. And then he's getting ready, and then boom, Nick Nurse, boom, with his probably Nick Nurse branded mask, steps yeah. up and just hammers you. It is yes. a little leather backpack. It, it of course he did. Good. Yeah, he was yeah. probably rushing back to play with the Arkells, and he's like, you know, I'm late for the show. <laughs> I'm yeah, I think it was be... his guitar. His guitar yeah. hadn't arrived yet. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's Probably. very it. Yeah, somebody probably from the Arkells was like, take care of that guitar. We don't have to do this again. <laughs> 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 We've done this enough already for this guy. <laughs> when will he stop? I love that. Uh, so you obviously melted in front of Nick Nurse. You oh, yeah. Actually... No, I was like, yeah. I'll, I'll just take uh, five steps immediately in reverse oh, here, and I'll get back to the line with the, with the rubes. I'm sorry, Mr. Nurse. You're oh, the so leader you just completely why... bent the knee? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I, I just wanted the piece of paper. Like, all I, I, was, uh, yeah. like, I, just, I didn't have a conversation I wanted but to But you have didn't just me. hold your ground and say, hey, man, look at these. Because you had the trump card in that situation, which is the yeah. screaming children, and be like, yeah. hey, Nick, look yeah. at these. Hey, Mr. Nurse, coach. Hey, coach. You should have called yeah. him coach. That would have been great. Yeah. Hey, coach. Um, don't well, you see <laughs> those two children that are having the meltdown in yeah. here? Right. What, do, what do you think is happening? Those are mine. I yeah. need them. And usually people what, you will got just... a game tomorrow, Nick? No, right. no, you don't? <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I think you can wait a, a little bit longer. For but you got to go watch Scotty Barnes and shoot more air balls? Like, yeah, it's, uh, we're, we're waiting here. Rude. Okay. Okay. Uh, God, that's so funny. That's so perfect. I can't believe you just <laughs> melted down. You, of all people, being a sports broadcaster, shouldn't have been at all well, intimidated I, by him. I didn't know, but I was a little confused at first. I was like, because he's wearing a mask. I'm like, that's yeah, just, but you knew because he's and he wasn't wearing the glasses. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's nah, Nick Nurse. Know. He was wearing his and, Nick Nurse hat. He had no, all Raptors stuff. <laughs> like, Is that Nick Nurse? Could it be? I don't uh, think it could be. Uh, oh, that's so good. So one of the your surprising things about the trip was when I was talking to you before you left, mm -hmm. we were trying to coordinate the potential of you coming on one day, right? Yeah. Because, yeah, it's nice. It's nice to have you on. It's the summer, blah, 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 blah. I don't need to explain myself that I tried to ruin <laughs> your vacation. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to explain myself. But uh, – you kept telling me, I, I don't think I'm going to watch very much of the Blue Jays. I, I don't think I'll be tracking the Blue Jays, and I, I don't see how I'll watch any Blue Jays games. And I get that because um, I go through this exact process where I think, hey, I'm going to unplug. I'm going to disconnect. I'm yeah. not really going to spend very much time watching sports this week. And then I guess what I end up doing every time is watching all the sports and being yep. completely apprised of everything and feeling right. like an idiot for taking vacation because all I'm doing is – not working for the three hours and then all the rest remains that happened to you you watched a lot of blue jays uh not only did i watch a lot of blue jays i watched a lot of blue jays like immediately i, yeah. I paid for the horrible wi-fi on the flight to texas and it was so poor that i could not stream video yeah. of the the red sox game but I was just watching, literally watching the, the MLB at bat app as the yeah. pitches are being thrown. And then we land, and I can use digital data. I watch Marcus Semyon's walk-off home run in game one of that doubleheader sitting at the baggage carousel where my baggage actually did arrive at uh, Houston International Airport. So, yeah. No, I watched, like, almost every second of every Blue Jays game that's happened the last week. By the way, before we pivot into this, I've been – trying to get more engagement from people throughout the show um i had like the last week um this sounds bad when you say it like this but it was better trust me um jerry jones put salt all over an 
McGriddle, which is like the pancake one. He eats it before he goes to Cowboys games. So an average McGriddle, it has more than the recommended amount of salt for an adult male over 80 years old in one day. But Jerry Jones is Jerry Jones. This is a man who's just constantly moving around the universe with a cup full of Johnny Walker Blue. Yeah. And he decides the amount of salt that he gets in the morning. And that's a lot. He actually get, he breaks open the salt, salt shaker and like not just a little shake – they count eight shakes on camera, and they're actually cut away while he's salting <laughs> this McGriddle. Yes, I know. This? There's no, That's there's insane. no amount of. Yes, I know. I, I, I can't believe they cut away because if I'm, if I'm the editor of this film, if I'm working with HBO, if I'm doing Hard Knocks, the most important thing is to see exactly how many shakes of the salt shaker this guy puts on. So we did. Um, disgusting food habits, and there are some savages who listen to the show. Like truly disgusting people that I say go to Moon Jail. Moon Jail was full that day, my friend. Like it was, it was a chock full bus up to Moon Jail. <laughs> now I want to know from people. Now uh, what I need for the rest of the show is interactions with celebrities. Give me your interaction with celebrity stories because I know that Ben should have met Nick Nurse. But the point of this is that. Everybody thinks that they're just going to be a normal person around a celebrity until they actually meet one. And Nick Nurse, I'll say he's a celebrity. He's a coach of a championship winning team. And like, not just an interaction where you're on their territory, not where you get backstage passes to a show because you know what that is. Or when you go to a game and you have, I'm talking about, have you ever met somebody famous out in the wild? Like, have you ever been at a bar? Have you ever been out somewhere and interacted with a celebrity and had to be cool? Or was it a complete meltdown? Hit me up in the DMs at JD Bunkus on both Twitter and Instagram. Um, you, I'm not going to check the text line today. So do it on there. At JD Bunkus, uh, at Sportsnet Ben. Let us know about celebrity interactions that you've had. And especially if you were horrible in them. Because that's, that's the better story. And if you were cool, I, I bet you you weren't as cool as you thought you were. Okay, so back to the Blue Jays. Um, you watched all these games. And obviously, as did I. I actually didn't watch Friday's game live. I ended up catching up on it on the, uh, the old DVR and the Blue Jays in 30. Yeah. Oof. So, yeah. Um... Not exactly uh, one that I was going to save and keep there. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's funny. I, sometimes I save sports on my DVR, and I think I'm going to go back and watch this game. It's never. like, no, you're never going to no. go back and watch this You never game. even, like, how often do you go back into your phone and rewatch videos you've taken or pictures you've taken? It's Actually, like, pretty frequently. Oh, okay, you would well, be surprised. Yeah, no, I, I do that more often than not. I don't, here's what I don't do. I never look at the ones if I'm at a concert or... Yeah fireworks or you know yeah. the the classic staples of bad but um i can't get over this feeling and i want to talk to shulman about this later too where i can't quite quantify what it is about this team that makes it so up and down if it's just the nature of the sport if it's just the fact that they had bad bullpen luck earlier in the season and so <laughs> that's creating this lens but They've had these opportunities to really get back into the mix, and it always feels like the Blue Jays are the team this year where, you know when you're watching a basketball game and there's like a 10-point swell, and you keep getting it down to four points, but you can't get over the four points. Four points, and then and it's just one of those games, and you know it, and you're watching it, and you feel it, and it ends up being confirmed. That the Blue Jays kind of have that vibe of a team this year, of every time they get hot, every time they get some momentum, something like this happens. And you labeled last night's game, or yesterday afternoon's game, as a Ben Ennis must win. You're now 4-1 and one in must wins, which I feel like if you're not perfect in that category, that you're, you're nothing. That one's pretty good. It's pretty good, but it's also like if they're the all Jays must wins. The record is is nine games over five hundred. Yeah. I mean, f- four and one is quite a more extensive uh, winning percentage than right. what the Blue Jays have. It's just, it's better than their winning percentage. Sure, I'm just saying that if it's a must win, that if they've lost one, then they're done. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah. no, it's not like I. But yeah, the, the contention wasn't that they fold the franchise if they lose one of the must wins. Well, I'm just saying, what are the parameters of the must wins? Are they like, they're not exactly must wins now, are they? If they've lost one, they're kind of. It's a oh, turn of phrase. Really yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I just want to clarify. I just wanted to clarify. Anyways, they've basically got to play like six twenty, six fifty ball the rest of the way out here to make the playoffs. And 
there's just this part of me, and I don't know if it's just being negative or what it is, but that yeah. feels like they're the can't-get-over-the-hump team where it's that basketball game where you're watching a team try to close that four-point gap, and every time they get it to four, the other team goes on a run. Let me explain this to you because I've actually been thinking a lot about this, this very same thing. Uh, well, one, road trips are tough. Winning baseball games on the road is tough, even for no the doubt. best teams. Winning baseball games on the West Coast as an East Coast team are always tough. These and if West they Coast just trips, win the Mariners game that they were supposed to win because right. I don't see an angle where – that play was ridiculous. I still can't understand that. Like, why didn't we get an explanation from Major League Baseball? I, why didn't we get a screenshot? I did, of I, it, as soon as they showed the, the laces, I thought that – it was out was the correct call, but I could see it. I, I, I didn't know. I didn't think there was enough to overturn it. Let's, okay. let's just put it that way. Um, yeah, and if they win these two games against Washington, who has a big time, mm-hmm. they've just given up on the season. They've won three yeah. games since the trade deadline. They're like, look at their win loss record mm-hmm. since the trade deadline. They have packed it in, and they. Like, the Orioles also packing it in. The Red Sox, their season's on life support. They go into Baltimore, play the Orioles, sweep them in, in three straight. Like, yeah. usually when you talk about sweeping a series against a team, you're like, well, it's baseball, and, you mm-hmm. know, it's really hard. No. Washington, Baltimore, you really can expect to win, if not all of those games, almost all of those games. And winning mm-hmm. all of those games not out of the realm of possibility. Winning on the road is very difficult. But the... The real nut graph of what's happening to the Blue Jays is they're not a perfect team. They're not They're not without their flaws. And the major flaw is the bullpen. So they have to out-hit teams. Mm-hmm. They have to think about going 500 against the good teams and then just mashing on these teams that aren't so good. And that, that's why a couple of weeks ago I put out the the statistic of going 500 against the teams that are above 500 and then just smashing those lesser lights that they have. They have a ton of bad teams upcoming. So you got these two against Washington. I know the Tigers have played well recently, but they haven't played outside of their division except for the Red Sox series where they took two out of three and the Red Sox were absolutely floundering. You have six Tigers games coming up before the end of the month. Sandwiched in between that, you've got a White Sox series, but at home. And and pretty clearly... Playing at Rogers Center is a major contributing factor for this Blue Jays team. And then you come back home, another three against the Baltimore Orioles. This is where you have to go on a run. Why are you laughing at me? I'm not laughing at you. I'm listening to you. I'm laughing at – I'm getting DMs about people's horrible stories, and I, I, I couldn't help but peek. But, okay. yes, go on. I'm listening to you. All right. I'll just wrap it up with this. Yes, they're not a perfect team. The bullpen is still clearly an area – of need. Yeah. They've done the best they could do in season to address it without getting a fireballer um, closer, somebody that mm-hmm. throws 99 and misses bats. Adam Simber has been as good as you could have reasonably expected him to be. Trevor Richards had a couple of hiccups, but he's been more than adequate. Brad Hand has been not so great, and Joaquin Sori is hurt. But that's still an area of need. And Thomas Hatch and Nate Pearson need to impact the back end of that bullpen if they want to go, if they are to go where they want to go by the end of the season. I still believe in this team's ability to make the playoffs just because mm-hmm. of the softness of the schedule. But like the next couple of weeks are going to be the deciding factor for the season. Yeah, the 11 of their next 15 games are against Detroit, Baltimore, and Washington. They have a four-game set against Chicago where you just need to not throw up on yourselves. Yep. you got to go. And tune. that's at home. Like I said, like yeah. the, 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 this team clearly plays differently at home. White Sox stub yeah. their toes in a big way against the Yankees over the weekend. The only thing with playing at home is that uh, if we're looking at stuff, right, like if we're looking at trends with this team, Simber and Richards, yeah, both those two guides, there's a little bit of regression right it's just and and this isn't this isn't trying to be negative this is just trying to be factual is that when you get these extreme results the usual next step is to see poor ones because it's not more common to stick with extreme results and so far simber's results have been extreme i put like especially against lefties i mean this is and i tweeted this out yesterday that 
what do you take? Like, do you, do you yeah. believe that the guy who's been in the majors for a half decade is all of a sudden right. a different pitcher because no. he's 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 a destroyed lefties this season. They've had have an OPS under 600 this year. Or do yeah. you go with the larger sample of his entire career where and it also matches the eye test? Like, how many side arming righties do you think uh, just destroy lefties? It does not happen. Sure, lefties for his career have an OPS over 800. Is there some regression coming in that regard? Yes. I would imagine so. But it's they can't afford regression in that area, right? And no. it's the same thing with coming home. Is you just went nine and two there? I don't think that you're going to be playing nine and two ball the rest of the way at home. I just don't. <laughs> Sorry, I I'm I'm not viewing this as you're going to win. You know what is that? Eighty seven, eighty six percent of your games. Like I I just it's not. It's not going to happen. There's going to be some regression here, so we have to be realistic. But you're, to me, yes, this next 11 of 15 that I outlined, you've got to win straight up nine of those games. Yes. Oh, like, easily. Th- those, those 11 games, or sorry, those 15 games, like, God, you've you got to come out of this with just a ridiculous record, and it feels daunting, and it feels looming and huge. But what do you and I always say? We say this with all sports. The good teams, the actual good teams, don't blow it against these lesser lights. And so far this season, that's where the Jays have been incredible. And that's the one thing that's kind of holding me into real hope that this stretch run is going to be legit and that they are going to push into the playoffs. But you can't have any more of these hiccups. And ugh, I, I just, yes, it's, it, it's compounded by the fact that their division is so red hot and that they're facing these other bad opponents and so, like, Normally, some of this stuff wouldn't be as bad, right? It's just that you're there's four teams above you that are all pretty quality. And even someone like the Mariners that we want to crap on, it's like they're a competent baseball team, right? Like they're not terrible. They throw good starters out there. They've got a lot of guys in the bullpen. And then there's just dudes who work good ABs. They don't have the mashers that the Blue Jays have, but no. there's not a lot of easy outs in the lineup where you just go through them and say, oh, yeah, like this part of the lineup, oh, it's dog. Um, it's it's a, They're a pretty tough team. I just I'm hoping, hoping, hoping that there isn't just some kind of little fatal flaw here wow. that is looming, and it and it really does feel too like so Vlad has been better, and there was this whole discussion about Vlad being fatigued, and yes, he's not hitting home runs, but he's ripping baseballs right now. But then you remember that that's what he did last year; yeah. he was still hitting the baseball hard, it just wasn't leaving the yard. So what does that mean? Because he had, did you see that from the other night? He had a record, a Major League Baseball record of three balls that were, like, all hit over 115 miles per hour. And yep. none of them, I think, left uh, – no, none of them were hit, like, into the outfield. No, he has he has three extra base hits uh, since the calendar flipped. That yeah. is not going to get it done because yeah. we've seen this with Vlad. He's been a fine hitter. He's hit 280 with a half-decent on base that – the difference has been he has gotten on base a lot more because pitchers are a little more afraid of him because they know you make a mistake, it leaves the yard. Bo Bichette doesn't have an extra base hit in forever. Those two guys absolutely have to start carrying the load again, and especially if George Springer is going to miss any prolonged uh, amount of time here, although the news is good on him. And you would think that, yes, with the two off days this week and the two games against a Washington team that you should be able to pound into sand without half your roster, that that would be okay. Again, yeah. this is anything can happen in that Washington series, but like that's that's basically the the worst team in baseball since the the trade deadline. So yeah, you should be able to beat that team without George Springer. I uh, have a ridic- I I really didn't think that the celebrity interaction thing would pop off the way that it did, but it absolutely has. I have so so many um <laughs> so many. Also, it's interesting to see, you know, what people's version of a celebrity is. Like one guy, I'm I'm looking at it. He's like, I ran into Darren McCarty, and I'm like, that doesn't count. <laughs> like, it's like <laughs> that's Darren McCarty no. is not is is not the bar here Absolutely. for a uh, for guy. I like this this one. I'm just gonna read quickly because I'm gonna go through a couple of these. Uh, this one's from Jacob. My worst one was Chris Bosch when I was working as a server uh, on the bar side at front. Uh, I dropped off some drinks and tried to make small talk, and he was having none of it. I thought he would have been nicer. <laughs> that is that is my favorite one. That was the one I laughed at, because like you thought that Chris Bosch, going to the bar that's just closest to work, who was trying to unwind, and he's six foot eleven, Chris Bosch. He's not blending into things. And then the bartender comes over and is like, hey man, 
Do you want to chop leather. it up? Do you want to chop it up with me right <laughs> now? And then he's like, no thanks. And you're like, wow, <laughs> that guy's a jerk. <laughs> hey, isn't that guy not so nice? I thought he would have been nicer. I just picture you going to, to the back staff, to the weights. That, Chris Bosh is a real jerk. I tried to talk to him about basketball, and he didn't want to talk about basketball. I just <laughs> thought he would have been nicer. Wow. Also, someone wrote, they ran into Jerry Howarth. Do you think that's celebrity? Absolutely. Oh, the guy's gonna you end up really? in Cooperstown one okay. day. Okay. No, that's I just wanted legend. to know. I just wanted to know. I just wanted to know. Because uh, he said, "This is." I ran into Jerry Howarth randomly. This is from Tim. Yeah. I know. I'll forget. By the way, you got to follow, otherwise I'm going to not read these. Uh, and I stared at him blankly, mind racing, attempting to think of an intelligent baseball question to ask him that he may have never heard before, <laughs> which is so great that you thought that you'd be able to pull that. Instead, I said, so do you miss it? <laughs> to which he very coolly replied, not a day goes by that I miss it. My heart was racing all day. Tim Kitchener, uh, he's a legend in the voice of my summers as a kid. Yeah, Jerry's, I think Jerry's a celebrity, especially, yeah, if you grew up a baseball fan in this city, there's not too many people that are bigger. I, I just, I love the idea that this guy thought, that's my favorite part. And you know what? I, I learned this lesson, so f- this is one for me, is when I was uh, in university... I moved Phil Kessel to Toronto. I worked as a mover during the summers, and I moved Phil Kessel to Toronto. And I was so excited because I was this huge Leafs fan, and he was the face of the Brian Burke, you know, rebuild, truculence, and all this crap. And uh, my buddy and I, when we moved Phil into his condo, I tried to talk to him about hockey, and he could not have thought of me as more of a dork. I was like, who do you think you're going to play with, Phil? <laughs> you know, like, who, who are you interested in playing with here? And he's like, ugh. And my friend is, uh, notices that he's got, like, some UFC stuff. He's just, like, talking about UFC. He's talking about he's got a hot tub in his place. And what the, anyway, he's talking about everything other than hockey. And Phil is loving this dude. And for me, I'm on the outside being like, boy, oh, boy, I sure hope that it's going to be a good season. <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> ugh. The, the cringe button could not have been mashed more than that. And it's so true is that if you ever do, this is actually my advice. If you do meet somebody whose trade is sports and you can bring them something that is in sports and just treat them normal, that is the play. That is always the play. It's not to try to think about on the spot the Jerry Howard story that he's never heard before. That guy spent right. how many years in baseball? 50? Yeah, pretty close. You're not going to have the <laughs> the question. Jerry Howard's not going to fall to his knees like, I Hadn't thought of that before, <laughs> Tim. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. The infield fly rule is problematic in that. Ban the shift, you say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you run yeah. into J.D. Bunkus, don't talk yeah. to him about sports. Talk to him about No, no, definitely talk soup. to me about sports because I don't know anything about it. Yeah, soup is good. Soup is good. Uh, yeah, talk to me about anything like that. Anyways, I'm going to sift through these during the break. Uh, keep hitting me up, at J.D. Bunkus, on uh, Instagram and on Twitter. Uh, both are good, but I, I always say Instagram is better. But shoot a follow there. I'm going to read some of these uh, with old Benny Ennis. Next, good show. Sports at 5.9 of the fan. Okay. <laughs> I'm reading people's awkward celebrity interactions. Again, at JD Bunkus on Instagram. This is the best place. That's where I'm looking at them right now. It's just easier. They don't filter out the messages like Twitter does. So shoot a follow and uh, hit me with your story. I, I think it's going to be tough to beat this one. I love this one. This is my favorite one so far. It's from Raf Al. Uh, he wrote, <laughs> weird celebrity interaction. Was at a music festival and saw Yellow Wolf, the rapper. You know who that is? No, I didn't think you did. So he's a rapper. So <laughs> he's walking around having a beer. Naturally, I asked to get a picture with him. I didn't know what to do with my hands in the pic, so like an idiot, I wrapped one arm around his waist. <laughs> you could see how uncomfortable he was in the picture. <laughs> you had a middle school dance, like, dance in a stairway. <laughs> Shoulder. Is he, is Dude, he eight feet tall? Yeah, like, why? why? Yeah, I, I don't you gotta, know. I'm actually crying laughing at that one, thinking about this rapper the who waist. you just wrapped your hand around his waist for the picture. Holy crap, that's so funny. I honestly am dying at that. Please send the picture, Raph. 
I need to see the picture of you with yellow pants, yeah. your arm wrapped around his waist. Oh my god, I almost passed out reading that. That's just too good. I get it though. Like waist. that. Though, no, but that is the hardest part about taking a picture with somebody when uh especially i think girls just have it down more but like guys we don't know what to do with our hands especially when it's like a stranger and so you have like the either there's some guys the most comfortable is if you're just a big guy because if you're big you can just throw your arm around the shoulder and be like what's up you get the upper hand the lever it's great it's a great move but if you're my height or your height (laughs) there's no natural move oh my god i almost dropped my phone laughing so hard at that i just i I am dying i I might do the awkward thumbs up I might do like a, a yeah, an intentionally cheesy thumbs up. A thumbs up? With a big, with a big smile. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I almost threw up. I laughed so hard at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's too early. All I have is coffee. And I. some of these are so great, too, where like it's not a story. Like this guy just wrote, I met Art Attack at a pizza joint in Florida. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, was it weird? Was it weird? Uh, that's really good. Um, okay, so I'm going to keep reading a couple more of these. <laughs> I'm going to sift through them throughout the show. Keep them coming. At JD Bung is on Instagram and uh, on Twitter. But again, I'm going to check out here first. Oh, my God. Um, so I talked about something last week that people either got in their feelings about or – Uh, They just, there were some strong opinions and it was total recency bias, but it had to be asked, which is Alec Manoa has now put up 11 starts and Mm -hmm. out of those 11 starts, he has five against the teams that the Blue Jays are chasing and the Red Sox, Rays and Yankees. And I know it's five starts, right? Which is ultimately nothing. But in those five starts, you want to guess how many runs he's conceded? Don't look it up. Uh, uh, Three? Five. Five. Five earned runs against in five starts. And... When I'm watching him pitch, like he has that game against the Angels where he gets the 11 punch outs. Mm-hmm. I see a playoff pitcher. I see a guy who is completely unafraid of the moment. And that can change, right? We've seen guys who in the regular season look as confident as anybody, and then they get to the playoffs and it's a different story. Like David Price, right? David Price sure. is pitching in huge games against the Yankees. Down the stretch for the Blue Jays when they got him in 2015, adversity strikes in the playoffs and it's a completely different animal. I have a really hard time with what the Blue Jays' top three pitchers are right now, who the top three pitchers are right now. Maybe I'm just completely out of line here, but do you think that if Manoa keeps doing this, and by this I mean genuinely be the Blue Jays' arguably best pitcher from a statistics standpoint, that he is going to insert himself in some type of a potential, hey, Blue Jays are in this chase for a playoff spot they actually end up getting in a playoff series what the pecking order of the top three is i think at this point there's no reason to think it's not robbie ray starting what would be a wild card game yep, that's or clear game one of a postseason series i also think it's pretty obvious at this point that if you're just going on merit this season what we've seen recently and what we've seen against the better teams in baseball that alec manoa should be starting ahead of hunjin ryu I'm not writing Hunjin Ryu off. And again, the deal looks better than I ever anticipated it looking yeah. almost through half of the four-year $80 million deal for a guy who hadn't proven the ability to stay healthy despite leading the National League in ERA with the Dodgers. He's still fine and, and great, and but he has the ability to get hit because he throws 89. And I understand the velocity's gone up and the strikeout per nines have gone up recently as well. Yeah, But they're... It, it has to be some of it, not all of it, because he's, he's, he's shown the ability to get outs at every level, including college, including his brief time in the minor leagues. Some of the Alec Manoa thing has to be mound presence. I, I, I'm, I'm sure of it, because he does not throw 99. He's a great slider. He's got a pretty good two-seamer, and the change-up's a work in progress. This is not a guy where you look at the arsenal and you're like, oh, well, there's the... Clayton Kershaw, 99, and then he's got the best curveball in all of baseball. Even when Marco Estrada was dominating for the Blue Jays, well, there's the best changeup in all of baseball. Th- there isn't that. He can can pump upper 90s-ish, but, like, how, how often does he hit 97? Like, that's a rarity in a start, and if he does, it's only a couple of times. This is a guy who pitches in the mid-90s with stuff that's not blow your socks off. Some of what he's done at the major leagues has to be what Nate Pearson hasn't shown, which is he's unafraid. 
he has confidence, and that's that's translating into success at the big league level. It sounds like a, a playoff pitcher to me, but like you said, until we see it, it's hard to say that. But he's my. If you're going on merit, it's Ray and Manoa too. Yeah, um, I think I feel the same way. And for some, I, there, I will admit that you put a little thing in my head with the Barrios trade, right? When you yeah. pointed out his statistics against the top teams in baseball, and then. He has that game against the Angels, and the natural inclination would be like, oh, that's just a game against the Angels. That's not a high-leverage spot. But to me, I actually thought, mm, that's against Shohei Otani, and it was a massive need win game. He had the awesome start against the Red Sox, which counters right. it. But right. these first impressions, I think that they matter a little bit more when we're watching them like this. So I, I don't mean to be like, oh, this guy jumps Brios, who's had a way more of a track record who you just traded for. But right now, if you're just asking me, point blank, who do I feel most confident in? I have the same rankings as you, that it's Ray 1 and it's Manoa 2. And until Manoa does the thing where he normalizes a bit or has that regression, I just, I, I'm, I'm there with him. I just, I'm really there with Manoa. And... Sports, there's always this balance of you're supposed to have it be a meritocracy, but we both know that it doesn't always work that way. That there is a little bit of, hey, well, we need to give this guy the ball. We need to make sure that uh, we're acquiescing to a star, that egos do matter in these rooms. But we already saw last season, like, they right. bumped Ryu off that one start. They didn't right. have him as the they, – they brought in Robbie Ray, who was walking everybody last season, couldn't do yep. a damn thing. No one had faith in Robbie Ray. Like, looking back on it now, it seems totally normal. At the time, it, people were apoplectic. And then they didn't have plans for Taiwan Walker, who goes over to the Mets and is, you know, throwing no-hitters through seven last night. He's looking incredible. He's had an amazing season. I don't think that they care. And so I, I really do believe that this is actually more likely than – maybe we're giving it credit for that this is actually a thing that could happen. No, those politicking things, those, mm -hmm. hey, you're an established veteran, that stuff plays during a 162-game regular season where there's yeah. a little room for error. Once you get to the postseason, like once you get to a one game and you're out or one game and you're through and then into a playoff series where your rotation stacks up against anybody else in the American League, there's, there's no time to – to care about people's feelings. You you go with whoever you think gives you the best opportunity to win a baseball game in that day. And now Barrios does have the postseason experience and it's been largely like not bad. He his first appearance uh four years ago, he gave up three earned over three. He's faced the Yankees two out of the three times he's been in the postseason with uh Minnesota. So it, I mean maybe you lean on a bit of that experience, but again, like if you're just going on things that we have seen every single level Alec Manoa has translated those skills, whether it be playing professional baseball for the first time or playing at AAA for the first time and dominating that level, coming to the major yeah. leagues, going to Yankee Stadium for his first ever start, dominating that Yankees team. He has one bad start in his entire career, and that came against the Orioles, where his command was a little bit off and they have the bench-clearing thing and he gets suspended. Other than that, mm -hmm. he's, he's been as reliable as you could have ever hoped he would be. Got a couple more that I want to read before you go. This one from Sean. He said, Mo Pete stole my wallet. I'm like, okay, you got me. What? That's a good way to start a story. What? Hey, but no, this, this, this what? So here's a tip. Be like Sean, where you start with the lead is um, something like that. To, to, I need the hook because I'm getting yeah. a lot of these messages right now. Again, at JD Bunkus. So Mo Pete stole my wallet gets me in like, okay. Auto show 15 years ago. I asked him to hit an autograph. He asked me for something to sign. I handed him my wallet. He put it in his pocket and walked away. I stood there like an idiot and watched. He came back laughing and gave me an autograph. That, so I love that move by Mo Pete. That's that funny. that makes me like that's Mo really Pete good. more because that's funny. You hand someone your wallet, they just turn away and walk away. And how tall is Mo Pete? He's like 6'7"? Yeah, he's a tall gentleman. He's I'm just saying 15 player. years ago, Mo Pete grabs your wallet and walks away. You're not like chasing him down and being like, give me that back. I'm going to beat you up. Like, no, you just have to stand there like this guy, Sean, and completely eat it. I like this one from Alex. Again, relating to celebrities, I said the advice is talk to them about something other than sports. This yeah. is not what I meant by that. Alex wrote me, I once saw Rudy Gay in an elevator downtown Toronto drinking a tall can of Arizona iced tea. I told him I also like Arizona iced tea. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he did 
not respond. It was a very awkward elevator ride. And, oh, man, I, I really like Me to too. picture Alex delivering that one. Uh, I also like Arizona iced tea, like her yeah. blurting it as he's drinking. He's like, I like the ginseng to- one, the green tea with yeah. ginseng. Oh, that one's That's the banging. only one to drink. That's If you drink any Arizona iced tea other than the green tea, Arizona iced tea, I think that – um, you're a lunatic. This guy wrote me. I ran into Kevin Barker at Vaughn Mills. He said that he was a very chatty and nice guy. Very chill. Do you count Kevin Barker as a celebrity? <laughs> I do not. Okay. <laughs> and you know what? You have uh, yeah. better interactions than I do with Kevin Barker. Yeah. Congratulations. You have a better relationship with Kevin Barker <laughs> than I do, who takes 100 uh, years to respond to my text and then makes yeah. up fake dentist appointments to avoid. Dude. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I'm doing Baseball Central this week. Guess who's on vacation? Kevin yeah. Barker. Won't yeah, be doing those no. shows with Kevin Barker. Whew. Yeah, no. Uh, Barks wants nothing to do with you. Um, <laughs> it's hard to top my Kevin Barker story, though, too. Oh, yes, where you saw him as a minor leaguer. and used to Yeah, heckle. I used to heckle him when he was in the minor leagues. We would go down to Ottawa to watch the Lynx play, uh, which is dating myself, but the Ottawa used to have a, a AAA team. And I used to – We Kevin Barker was genuinely our favorite guy to heckle. And I can't believe that he ended up actually working at Sportsnet. I've told Kevin this story before, but we used to go to, at the time, Syracuse Sky Chiefs games, sit at the first baseline, and nonstop heckle Kevin Barker. Like, once a guy that we were with printed out, like, all this information about Kevin Barker, knew his birth weight, (laughs) knew uh, it was... Yes, knew everything about him that you could possibly... Nine-pounder. He's a Brian nine-pounder. I can't, I can't, I can't repeat <laughs> the things that happened with the heckling. They were mostly funny. They were, they were good. Yeah. And you know, he did. Uh, I don't think he performed the best with this. And he says he doesn't remember. And he's, he's like, oh, I don't know. And he's made fun of me about it for being the guy in the stands when he's the guy in the field, which is fair, which is yeah. a fair take. But I think we got to him, and I think he remembers, and, and I think that he just won't really admit it. Um, and that, yeah, for whatever reason. God, some of these are so good. Again, I'm going to read some more of these throughout the show. Um, I like the ones that are awkward the most. Again, so if you've got some and you were cool in the story, I'm probably not going to read it. I'm just going to yeah. say to you right now, universally, like, good for you. That's like, There's some of these where they're like, hey, I ran into somebody and I didn't ask them for a selfie and I, and I didn't okay. fanboy awesome. or fangirl. Okay. I'm like... Yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> like that's you you did the thing that you're supposed to do. I want the person who yells out that she likes Arizona iced tea <laughs> the person drinking Arizona iced tea. <laughs> oh, so good. So unbelievably good. Yeah. Um Bananas, mm-hmm. I'm glad you're back. Yeah. Um I'm glad that you enjoyed glad also there's like people there's people who really don't get this asking me for like shout outs. I'm like there's there's not very strange. Very strange. This is very, very strange. Always happens whenever you open up these segments. Um, I'm glad you're back. You're on Baseball Central this week? Yeah, well, uh, Baseball Central moves back to uh, 2 to 3. So, yeah, Baseball Central, then two-hour edition of Writer's Block. So three hours of radio between 2 and 5 again. And then I'll be back on Good Show on Monday, <laughs> but you won't be because, I mm. don't know, you just have to be difficult like that. And then Tuesday we restart the show as per uh, per usual, but I'll be doing this show solo and then calling you to get you to do an hour between no. 9 and 10 of, on your vacation. No, but here's the difference is that – so you could call me if it's this week. This week you can call me, no problem. <laughs> that Monday is going to be after a bachelor part, a three-day bachelor party weekend. The reason I'm taking that Monday is recovery. Like you can call, but you're going to get a very raspy – uh, unintelligible voice from a guy who has not really seen sports outside of checking the scores on Sportsnet's app. So not dissimilar to now, but yeah, okay. Yeah, not. No, that's, just, that's a little <laughs> rude. Um, by the way, I got the picture from Raf, and it's just as good as I thought it would be. Good <laughs> arm around good. Yellow Wolf's waist. So so unbelievably good. Again, awkward celebrity interactions, just like old Ben Ennis, who, despite being a sports radio host and despite having yeah. genuinely 10,000 hours of training for this exact moment, melted and this wilted. This uh, moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's true. He, he just cut right to, through me. Yeah, he did. He just, you stumbled out of the gate. Nick Nurse talked to you and you, you couldn't handle it. You couldn't stand your ground. You couldn't yeah. uh, put together a sentence. Nothing, but he was nothing. right. He was right. Nick Nurse is a leader among men. That's oh, why. But, he so gets why his do you, whatever six million a year. Why do you interject with me then? I'm usually right on the show. You're usually wrong. That doesn't stop you from having righteous indignation as though you are correct. 
Disagree. Okay. Wholeheartedly. Yeah. All right, Benny. I'll talk to you later, buddy. Uh, when we come back, it's Ian Rappaport, Rap Sheet of NFL Network. It's a good show. Sports at 5.9 of the fan. It's a good show. Sports at 5.9 of the fan. I'm J.D. Bunkus. I asked you all to reach out today with your awkward celebrity interactions, and they're really good. And I actually kind of regret it because... I, I genuinely feel a little sick from laughing so hard at some of these. I, I'll, all I've had is coffee. I just have, you know, the coffee gut rod, and here I am reading these stories from people just throwing up all over themselves as they meet celebrities. Uh, our next guest, I can't imagine has such a tale. Cool, calm, under pressure, one of the biggest in the game. Seeing Rappaport, national insider for NFL Network and NFL.com, and of course, you can follow him on Twitter, at RapSheet. How's it going, Ian? What's going on? How are you guys? Doing well, man. So before what, you were... What were you wondering? Well, I said before you were Ian Rappaport, before you were the, the celebrity that people run into. Actually, maybe we should get it from the other side. Maybe we should flip this around. Do you remember a time where someone met you, was really, really excited to meet you, and absolutely basically threw up all over themselves and sort of sneakily embarrassed themselves in front of you, trying to either relate to you or get a picture or something along those lines? Um, I, I don't get people like horribly embarrassing themselves, but what does happen, especially for kids is they will come up and say hi and then just kind of not say anything. <laughs> so I had to, I remember like probably five years ago when this really started to happen, I remember talking to my wife who happens to be very smart, unlike me. And I was like, what do I do in those situations? So she came up with a plan for how to make sure that when people come up and say hello, it's not like an awkwardly horrible meeting. So they don't just freeze. So, like, I have a couple things that I can now ask them and engage in conversation to rescue them from themselves so they don't just stand there and kind of act strange. Wow, that's one of now. the nicest things I've ever heard, <laughs> like, that you're actually putting in the legwork to make people feel comfortable when it's them who are approaching you and asking you for your time. And that's quite a thing. Well, you, I, just don't, you just don't, you don't want anyone to have, like, a bad experience, you know? Sure. So just make yeah. it a little bit easier. I get that. As someone who's never been recognized in his entire life, I don't really get it. But, yeah, um, I, I can understand the sentiment. So uh, let's start with this. Which quarterback battle um, right now, after these first set of games, do you think was more muddied by the performance of a young player? Um, I think in New England with Matt Jones. You know, I mean, it's, it's, we obviously spent a lot of time on Justin Fields, had some nice moments, I thought, for the Bears the other day. But, you know, really nice moments against essentially the threes and the fours. Uh, and not that it takes away, but it, it is a little bit different to think about, like, who he's actually facing because, you know, if if Andy Dalton goes out, has some nice throws, a couple moments against, you know, another team's ones and then steps aside and then, you know, Justin Fields struggles for a little bit and then as he's facing basically the fours, he has some nice passes. Like, what did we really see? Trey Lance, we saw one great throw and some struggles. You know, certainly doesn't seem totally ready. Like, mo great moments, but doesn't seem totally ready. To me, Mac Jones is the one where he looked calm, he looked collected, he looked poised, and that's sort of what he's supposed to be. But you never quite know what's actually going to be like until you see him on the field. And I thought he looked really good. And I would also say that Cam Newton probably has the most tenuous grip on the starting job. Um, so that's probably the one that I'm watching the closest. What happens with Cam if he ends up losing that job? Are we sure that he just plays ball and is willing to stay there as a backup? Do you think New England has some type of an agreement with him where they're not going to keep him in that role? Because that's always been the tough one for people projecting the Cam Newton situation is seeing him as a guy who's cool and fine on being on the sidelines. I think Cam Newton over the last two years has gone from – Someone who, you know, there were times when he was a starter in Carolina where, I don't know how to like best describe this. You didn't know what you were getting or he was a little temperamental or he would, remember he would take like 45 minutes after losses and was just, was difficult at press conferences and just seemed to be immature. He's been the opposite of that in New England. Like, first of all, everybody loves him. They love the work ethic. They love the person. Like, obviously he didn't play great last year, but they were fine bringing him back because just of the kind of person he was. So maybe, like, five years ago, Cam would have said, like, screw it, I'm out. 
I don't know that this Cam would do that. Like, I think this Cam would say, you know what, I'm going to mentor this guy or at least, like, help him along, and I'm okay with that. That's what I think this Cam Newton would be like. So I'm going to expand a little bit on a couple of the guys that you just talked about because you mentioned the fields with the 14 to 20, 142 mm-hmm. yards, a couple of touchdowns, one of them a rushing touchdown. And, yeah, so they're against the backups, right? They're not in right. these high-stress situations. So we are supposed to take this with a grain. So I actually saw your one tweet. I think it was actually about Trey Lance, though, right, of don't overreact, don't overreact, yeah. don't overreact. But – there's, I actually think Andy Which Dalton. Which we do is, every year, and we still overreact. But yeah, ahead. and but I, I can't fault a Bears fan in this case, right? Like your option is Andy Dalton or this kid who shows up and his first impression is that, and feeling as though you are just going to be so overwhelmingly excited. If so, I, I'm assuming that at some point Fields might get an opportunity against not the third stringers, or that if he continues something like this against the third stringers, that he can steal that job. Or do we see it more as a scenario of? Andy Dalton is 100% getting these first reps. He is getting the first crack at this. Fields cannot steal it. It's just more of the at the first sign of a hiccup, Dalton is gone and Fields gets injected. I would say more than likely it's the first sign of a hiccup, Fields gets in there. However, um, you are going to see Fields today at practice in with uh, some more of the starters to kind of see what the chemistry is like. Mm -hmm. So at least – his play caught the attention of some people there. Um, But, I mean, the real question is, and I I get it from from Bears fans, because really, like, the last couple years, they've probably known for three years that Trubisky's not the guy, probably three years. And now you like, okay, I think we actually have it. So can we just see him play? The question is, though, who gives you the best chance to win? Because this is a coaching staff, this is a general manager, this is a front office that really does need to win. Um, so who really gives you the best chance? And, you know, if it is, in fact, um, Justin Fields, then that's amazing. Then you should play him. But if it's not, then there's no harm in him waiting a couple games, half a season, whatever it is, until he's ready. So all these things happened with the rookie quarterbacks, and this is generally the season or the time of year where we hyper-focus on them and we start making the parallels to Russell Wilson and we start saying who's going to steal this job and who's going to do what. And, yeah, you mentioned the Trey Lance thing where on social media you'd think that he had stolen the starting job, but then it ends up being – I can't remember what exactly he was. I think but he was like 5 of 13. I think it was like five, 5 for 14 or something right. like that, so, yeah. So it's, it's something where you probably, if you watch the entire thing, see – um, what makes the player so exciting, but in reality, it also shows you some of the reason why he's so far away. But I thought the biggest news was reported by you this weekend in regards to Carson Wentz. He's someone who initially has a report of five to 12 weeks, right? And we're all doing mm-hmm. the, oh man, Carson Wentz, this was all about a fresh start and him getting reps with Frank Reich, and now he's not going to be around the team. Now they're trying out between these two rookie quarterbacks that are neither of them ideal. Wentz isn't going to be around the team. He's going to be working from behind, all this stuff. And then all of a sudden it goes from potentially week one. What happened here? How, how is this happening this way? Well, I think what happened with Carson Wentz is the surgery was really good and really positive. Basically what they did was they went in and they removed a bone that had kind of dislodged. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you never quite know what's going to happen in surgery until you get into it. And it sounded like the report from actual surgery was really good. So he was at practice, say, a couple of days later um, and without a walking boot. So some optimism there. Now, Jim Mersey did say this week they're not going to put him on the field. He's 100% ready, 100% ready. So we'll see, uh, but certainly some optimism for Wentz there. Uh, I think that's pretty great for Colts fans who um... – already had a lot of reservations about Carson Wentz, and then when the injury happened, it became, uh, oh, this is absolutely terrifying. Uh, we might right. be starting Jacob Eason uh, in week one. Right. And as somebody who uh, watched Washington football, I can't say that I'd be like fully thrilled about that being the week one starter for a team with Super Bowl aspirations. So you also reported about Dak Prescott's shoulder. and Or sorry, that he's, yeah, he's clean. Everything going into the season looks okay. But we're a month yeah. away, and I'm curious when, because your report said that you know he's just starting light throwing. Are we fully confident that the Cowboys are going to throw him into the fire and have him be the Week One starter, or that this is something where maybe they ease him into the season? No, he's he's going to be the Week One starter, um, and I think 
you know, that's another one where everyone was kind of holding their breath, but it really came out probably as good as it needed to. You know, like I think um, the tests were good. His He has not pushed it and the team has not pushed it, which has led to some people being like, what's going on? It's weird. But that's the best thing, actually, because Dak wants to push it all the time. He always wants to practice. And he was not happy that he didn't get to practice. From the other side, it was the best thing for him. I mean, it really was. So I think it's all positive, and he's going to end up fine, and he'll practice today a little bit. Mm-hmm. And if he has no setbacks, then he's kind of off and running. And this was an important issue to take care of, but not something that's going to negatively affect his season. This is kind of inside baseball, but when a team is on hard knocks, is it easier or harder to report on them? Because I would imagine that there's a lot of buzz around the team. I don't know, maybe HBO ends up getting protective of some of the storylines, of some of the things that are going to get revealed. Like, how, how does that work in terms of your obligations with reporting on those teams? Does it infect it at um, all? You know, I don't know that it really does. I, I mean, I don't know that it really will in this case. I've had some situations where there's news where I was going to, that I was going to break and people have been like, Oh, like, can you, you know, instead of doing it now, can you do it at this point? Cause we want it to be on hard knocks. Like that has happened to me before. Yeah. Um, and it's insanely annoying. Um, but it is what it is. We live in, you know, this is, it's all show business, right? So, yeah. um, it's kind of all part of it. I, I happen to like hard knocks a lot. Yeah. Um, I always watch it. So, you know, if, if the world changes only slightly, Hard knocks and text things, I'm okay with it because I really like the product, but um, it does sometimes make teams kind of get into the show business world a little bit, I would say. Mm. So I thought one of the biggest stories out of the last couple of days, again, it's we, we tend to hyperemphasize, nationally anyways, the quarterback battles, that this is what this time mm-hmm. of year is. And then locally, you're looking at down the roster and veterans trying to make these teams, guys who are names. But I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that this happened. And I don't know if this is more of a viral story or this is something that's kind of been kicked up to you, but taunting, which is supposed to now be a major emphasis of this season. So there's this clip from the Colts game where a running back that I, yeah, I named saw. Benny LeMay, he trucks a bunch of players, turns the legs, he's carrying the pile. It's just an awesome, awesome football play, right? And these players on the Panthers, he turns around and he celebrates by, I think, just kind of like lightly tossing the ball, has a flex. I, you know, no one can hear what he's saying, but the assumption is that it isn't very long. It isn't something that looks that bad. Um, and he gets hit with that penalty, the taunting penalty. And now there's all this discussion on social media of whether the NFL is going to crack down on plays like this and fans are terrified that it's going to be something that the league is trying to push away with. We saw this with touchdown celebrations a while back where the league ended up starting off from a position where they were pretty harsh and then walking it back and allowing touchdown celebrations to continue. What do you think is going to be happening with taunting? Is this something that is just, you know, a one-off and a social media story, or is this something where players and fans around the league actually do have some reason to be concerned with the way this is going to be officiated? I don't know that they have reason to be concerned, but it is the way it's going to be officiated. I mean, to me, like, there's a massive difference between celebrating and flipping the ball at someone like, you know, we can look at that clip of the Colts running back, which I've seen also, and, and say how bad it is. We don't know what he said. Um, and the official standing right there. Mm-hmm. So to me, you know, if we assume the officials have some semblance of an idea of what they're doing, then I think we can sort of infer that there was a reason why the penalty was called. Right? Like, I don't think the officials are generally like, hey, let's ruin this game. I think they're more like taunting is not allowed, and that was taunting. Um, to me... Like, there are kids watching the game, and it is okay, as far as I'm concerned, to say, let's not be jerks to people, but let's celebrate in a good way. Like, I don't think it's going to ruin the game. I don't think it's anything fans need to be afraid of. Um, I think if it was their own children on the field, they'd probably be fine with this rule also. So, yes, it's going to happen, but I don't think it's going to be anything negative. I'll say that. So last one, and this is a little bit more difficult, so sorry for spraying on it, but what do you think the story okay. from camp is right now that isn't getting enough coverage? Any camp? Um, I mean, it's definitely not sexy, but there's a bunch of teams that are struggling for offensive line help. You know, the Bears just signed Jason Peters, who's, you know, a Hall of Famer, but probably 700 years old. 
Yep. And there's a decent chance he's the starting left tackle for them. Oof. And that's, you know, you sign him in the middle of August and he's going to be your starter. Like, that's that's hard. Um, you know, nobody cares about reserve offensive linemen, but there is a absolute battle for them right now. And, you know, someone's season is going to be affected because they just don't have enough people to block. So, you know, no one cares, but certainly a noteworthy situation to watch. Well, I think uh, Bears fans should care because if they want Justin Fields back there, um, the (laughs) assumption is usually when you're putting rookies in those spots, you really don't want to have them have their eye level changed, right? We've always had that since the the David Carr thing of, hey, the first season you come in, if you just get beat up the entire time, how's that going to change you as a yeah. quarterback? And I, I guess that now I'm, I'm, I'm lying. I lied about that being the last one. The last one is now the Joe Burrow situation because this is the one that everyone is tracking with offensive line. Everyone wants to know if this guy is going to have good enough protection, how he's feeling mentally, whether or not um, he is going to be the starter this year has been a real conversation um, amongst at least football fans when it comes to, hey, is this the right thing for this guy's career to throw him back in there when he's not ready and they have that offensive line? I wonder if these reports or these conversations are as serious as you think that, um, that, that uh, as serious as you've heard. I mean, I haven't heard anything to say that he's not going to be the starter. Um, mm-hmm. But I would say this, like he had a very serious injury. And the fact that he's able to be out there to start camp is great. It really is great. Uh, but I was in New England when Tom Brady was coming back from a similarly, similarly serious ACL. Mm-hmm. It is hard, and it doesn't come back in a day. So, you know, are we going to see the best Joe Burrow that we'll see all season on September, you know, 12th or whatever it is? Probably not. But that's okay. Um, it's important that he's out there. He's going to learn and figure it out. Um, I just don't think he's going to be all that he could be right off the bat. Ian Rappaport, National Insider for NFL Network and NFL.com. And, of course, you can follow him on Twitter, at Rap Sheet. Get all that breaking news that uh, I was discussing earlier. Thanks for making time, man, and thanks for being so nice to the fans. <laughs> no problem, man. Thanks for having me. Take care. Take care. Ian Rappaport. I don't agree about the taunting thing. I think if it... And gets picked up on a microphone. These broadcasts have delays. And if it's really that egregious, you can pop them out. And that ultimately, these are grown-ass men playing a grown-ass man sport who are going 110 miles per hour, constantly pushing it in the red. And if the interaction for taunting is that they spin a ball or they point forward. Like, I want to know what the line is here because, and quite frankly, I, I, the league would never do this and they would never say what Benny LeMay said. That's the running back of the Colts that got hit with the taunting penalty. But tell us at least that he said something. Someone report somewhere and make it easy to find that this guy actually said something that crossed the line. Because yes, if you do that, Fine. If you say something that crosses the line, fine. And everybody knows what the lines are. They're pretty clear. But if that's all he did after... Go watch this play. It's all over social media today. Warren Sharp had it. Guy is carrying a pile of Panthers players for an extra 10 yards. And he celebrates by flexing and jawing a little bit. That's the sport. That is pro sports. And the NFL is so hypocritical because they use those clips in highlights to promote the league. And then they're telling the players don't do it. So you've basically raised a bunch of players on the idea of this is what you do. You celebrate. You show emotion. You show passion for the game. But then if you actually do it during a game, they're not going to they're going to ding you with 15 yards and take away the run. You just want guys all doing the same thing, put the ball down because kids watch the league? Like, I I hate that. If you can't explain to your kid, and I don't have kids, so fine parents who are willing to hit me with that. But if you can't explain to your kid that someone is just celebrating a, a, a good run with some enthusiasm and that, hey, there's a difference between showing emotion and being a poor sport. Like that just doesn't seem like that hard of a conversation to me. 
That doesn't seem all that <laughs> difficult. Maybe I'm wrong. I just know that that sucks. And when Ian says that refs don't want to ruin the game, I don't know. There's a lot of refs out there that really... I've been watching sports a long time. And those of you listening to the show have too. And you're telling me that there's no umpires like Joe West who like to sign autographs before the game? You think the Hockleys don't like being on camera? Come on. Why do you think some of these dudes pivot so well into media? They like being on camera. They like having attention on them. They like being a part of the game. And so the more opportunities you give them to do that, where it's these arbitrary BS things, I think they're going to take some liberties with it, especially if the league is saying we've got to emphasize it. It's like a quota with speeding tickets. It feels the same way, where they go, okay, well, we've got to have some of these to show that we're actually cracking down on them. And there is nothing worse as a fan of sports when you feel like you're being robbed by officiating. Where they have made some hypocritical call that they're not doing both ways, that they do at some juncture in the game. And to me, taunting is exactly that. Yuck. Yuck. Do not want. Could not want less. From the rookie quarterback standpoint, I actually ended up watching a few of these preseason games and trying to track the breakdowns because I don't really need to see much else. And I'm not, I'm not going to be breaking down position battles and for teams that I don't know intimately. Like I know my own, I know a couple of others, and that's just about it. You got to focus on the Bills. You got to focus on the Cowboys because they're hard knocks. I focus on my Seahawks, but everything else is like still through more of a national lens. And, yeah, I just don't know how how the Bears could possibly do the Dalton week one thing if, uh, if Fields has another performance like this. Because I, I really don't care if it's – and it's not even just for fans. It's for the players on that team. The excitement of a guy going 14 of 20 and getting two touchdowns and just looking as poised as Justin Fields did. That guy, NFL body, NFL arm. The the abilities are just clear. And it's the same thing I felt like the difference with Trey Lance. Trey Lance clearly does things that open up Kyle Shanahan's playbook. He can do things with his legs that will change the dynamics of that team. The difference is, is that you can have him in some packages and I think that they'll they'll do that. Jimmy G to me still looks like the guy. We can look at the eighty yard throw, but that was it. That was the that was the throw. We made a couple of others, but and there was a drop on the first toss. But ultimately I think that there's a pretty significant gap between where Fields is at and where Trey Lance is at. And that, that one was a bit of a comeback down to earth moment for Niners fans if they watch that entire the the entire offensive sequences with Trey Lance. And then there's the guys who have their spots established, like the Zach Wilsons for Jets fans. And you feel a lot better about the throws he made. I, I love preseason for this. The, you just, you, you're able to completely get your hopes up. You finally get a little flash of something that you've been waiting on. And the good news is for fans of all these rookies is that no one was dreadful. No one with expectations came in and, and really looked like they couldn't play. But for Bears fans especially, that's all I can think of is markets where they've been tortured by quarterbacks for a really long time and they've missed on the guy and they've stuck with the bad guy too long. That has to be one of the best feelings in sports. Is going from being one of those teams that never has the quarterback to being all of a sudden the team that might have one. And I'll, I'll just say this about, so Seahawks had Matt Hasselbeck and he was good. He made some Pro Bowls, but then I remember those same feelings of watching Russell Wilson for the first few times and like getting to know Russell Wilson and that process of watching someone on the come up. And I think I've talked about this with Ariel Hawani before. Maybe it was someone else, but about how the best part of watching fighters on the rise in the UFC is that. Is it it's never quite like when they're getting their sea legs as players because your expectations aren't as high and there's just a different level of excitement to see something that's new. 
So I hope, because Bears fans are great. I don't hate Bears fans, even though they did beat the Seahawks in a playoff game once. Um, I really hope the Bears have a quarterback. I hope it's the story of the guy that got passed on and the guy that fell to them, the guy that really should have gone higher based on the college credentials, but for whatever reason fell. It's kind of the Jalen Suggs thing. But yeah, anyways. Um, I have more of your celebrity interactions, and I want to read a couple of them later in the show. But I liked this one from Cindy. I barfed words at Ernie Witt once. I told him I had one of those milk posters of him in my room as a kid and measured how tall I was getting next to life-size Ernie. I was supposed to bring him a scotch, but I got all weird and then brought him the wrong scotch. I Here's my thought on this story. I think that he appreciated it. I, I think that he would like a story like that. Hey, you had a poster. I had your poster. That's a good in. If you actually had a poster and it's specific like that and it's somebody who's not a super duper star, like if you met Michael Jordan, you're like, oh, I had your moon poster. He's like, yeah, everybody did. Everyone had that poster. If you met Joe Carter and you said I had your back-to-back poster, he'd be like, yeah, I'm. everybody did. Ernie, that's a niche one. Niche things I think work. I think if it's a niche thing, it works. This one is probably the worst. And this is the one thing you can't do. And there's a lot of stories, um, again, at J.D. Bunkus on Instagram and Twitter, of people misidentifying celebrities. Yeah, that's about as bad as it gets because these people do have egos. But I thought this one was funny from Ryan Beverly. I met a bunch of Toronto Maple Leafs at a bar in Barrie during training camp. My brother pointed out Mike Johnson at the bar. I went over there grabbed a round of drinks, and said hi to Mike. He told me he wasn't Mike. I was confused at his reply. I was thinking, no, you're Mike Johnson. I said something stupid and a bit rude and returned to my table where my brother then told me he was mistaken and that was Alan McCauley. Oof. (laughs) The being... Here's here's my other suggestion. Don't be rude. Ever. That it's never the right thing to do. And I know it's tough. You're in a bar, and I'm not really judging Ryan Bevs. You're probably a fine guy. You probably just had a, one too many drinks, and you were a little disappointed that uh, you thought someone was lying to your face. And that was lame to you. But if they're ever in these situations, just my advice is try to cool it and just accept that you've had the bad interaction and move on and take your story. But, and who doesn't – you know what's funny is no one uh, – people love having a celebrity story where they can inform their friends or strangers or whoever about whether someone is nice or a jerk. Right? What was he like? What was she like? Oh, he's so nice, so down to earth. Oh, he was a jerk. He didn't even give us any attention. She brushed me off. That's part of the story. That's ultimately all you're really looking for in this story anyways. So if they do happen to be a jerk, walk away. No one thinks you're a hero if you're trying to be like... I think one of the most awkward things is when people try to be on the level of a celebrity, when that's the story, when they go, I'm not going to take that from you and blah, blah. It's like, no, you're not. We're all just peasants out here. They are different, <laughs> living a different life. Just accept it. Just accept it and move on. I don't think I'm going to ask Thomas Hatch if he's ever had an awkward run-in with a fan. Maybe. But he's... He's only got 11 appearances for the Bisons this year. He's dealt with some injury stuff. But in those 11 starts, he's been phenomenal. And in case you haven't been tracking this Toronto Blue Jays team, um, they could probably have used the guy with the sub-3 RA out of the bullpen last year who could come in as a long man, who could come in in tight spots and give them big outs. So... 
I'm going to talk to Thomas Hatch about how his season's going, where it's heading, but also whether or not it's been a little frustrating having to watch this team struggle in an area that he was phenomenal in last year. It's good show. J.D. Bunkus, Thomas Hatch, Bison Starter. I think probably Blue Jay at some point this season. It's good show. Sportsnet 5.9 of the fan. It's good show. Sportsnet 5.9 of the fan. Is Thomas Hatch there? Lance? Good stuff. I mentioned it going to the break. Guy's having a great season as a starter. And I'm even even when it was Roberto Osuna, he was a relief pitcher. I've always been a, a believer that and this is not like a very hot take, but it's like if a guy can give you multiple innings and a guy can be a starter, you stretch him out as a starter. But the bullpen this year has been pretty good. And every single time somebody gets put on the IL. It always leads to the conversation around this guy who joins me now, Thomas Hatch, Bison starter. Uh, hopefully, uh, Blue Jay soon enough. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. So, yeah, how much of that do you get? Like, just from friends and family and Twitter and all those different things of every time there's an injury, every time somebody has a setback, the, is it you now? Are you, are you all right, man, like, I know you're doing really well with the starting thing, but, you know, they need you doing something else. I definitely get it quite a bit. Um, <laughs> yeah. Try to uh, try to ignore it a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, but it definitely pops up in my head a little bit. Um, but all you can focus on is yourself, and I feel like I've done a good job of you know limiting distractions this year. Um, obviously, started off on the wrong foot in spring training by getting hurt, but um, I felt like I you know put myself in a good position at this time of year, and I think uh, some of the hard work's paying dividends, and I feel good with where I'm at. Yeah. Was how did that conversation happen like from the beginning of the season because again you were so lights out in the bullpen last year and they, this team clearly needed starting depth. I actually remember when the season was getting underway and before you had gotten injured, we basically all had you down in pen to be one of the starters on this team, right? Like we thought, okay, there's going to be some open competition, but they brought Mats in. And at this point, Mats had been a little bit more up and down, obviously, with his uh, end to his Mets tenure. Stripling, we weren't sure if he was destined for the bullpen or if he was going to be a starter. And a lot of people thought that you had a real good shot of making the rotation. Had it not been for the injury, did you feel that was going to be the case or did you know you were going to start the year out in Buffalo? You know, I... I really didn't have much expectation going into spring. Um, obviously, that's what I would have liked. Um, mm-hmm. But we had that talk after the season last year with everybody was that uh, the plan going into spring was to be a starter. Um, and, you know, I got to two, two, three outings, and uh, they got hurt. So um, I don't think it was far enough along to kind of look at the roster and say this is where I belong or whatever that may be. But – um, you know, and after the injury, I think the plan was to just keep me as a starter as well. And obviously those guys did a really good job um, for the most part this season. And um, and so there was no opportunity there. But, um, you know, I feel like I, I showed that I did what I, I did last year. And um, I feel like um, going forward, I can do whatever the team wants me to do. Um, so whenever my uh, name is called, I'll be ready. Yeah. And, yeah, your minor league numbers have been great. And I know it's 11 appearances, I think, so far. And you're coming off of six innings, a five-hit ball. The ERA is just like a tick over three. So you've been great in the minors. Um, I think, though, it's one of those things where you're right. It's probably tough because you're focusing on something, and I'm guessing that you want to be a starting pitcher. But have there been conversations with the team around moving around? Like, has this plan changed to a certain degree? Because I would imagine having Pearson, his injury, and knowing that he was going to be moved to the bullpen, and then just right now where they lose Stripling to an oblique, that that always changes the math. Now you being, you know, the sixth starter on this team, that's exactly what you are right now. That takes away from the potential of you joining the bullpen, of you coming up here and doing that role. Has this been something that's kind of been fluid for you this year, or have they told you, like, hey, um, this is what it is. You need to stay as a starter. You're staying stretched out. This is your role, and, and we're not going to budge from it. Don't worry. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, even when I went up, you know, a few weeks ago, um, mm-hmm. they had me as long relief, even, you know, in the, 
but they also had me stretched out as a starter just in case Manoa couldn't make his start. So um, it's just very fluid. It's almost day to day, which has really been for the most part when I've been up in the big leagues. So um, that's how I took it last year. Um, I didn't know what my role really was last year until it solidified later in the year. So um, again, just taking it day by day and um, being ready whenever my, uh, my name's called. So again, that has worked out and you're healthy now. I think I read something somewhere that, you know, you're feeling as healthy as you've ever been. And some of this has been, you've made some mechanical adjustments this season, right? And I, I wonder, were those for health or effectiveness? Uh, you know, it's just more consistency than anything command oriented. Um, I feel like um, I was toying with some things and I really solidified what I wanted to do with uh, with my mechanics. And I feel like everything's really consistent. Um, fastball has been really good, been able to place it, and I've been really aggressive. That's been one of the goals with me as an organization is just, you know, pound in the zone. Um, and I feel like the last few starts have shown that, um, as well as with my changeup. You know, I kind of gone away with it, uh, away from it when I went up there uh, against Boston, which um, that's one of the other focuses is kind of, you know, not getting away from my strengths at times. Because um, sometimes you look at a scouting report and sometimes it can say, you know, this team's good against this or that. And uh, it can sway you away from what you want to do. Um, but I feel like, you know, this early in my career, it's all about adjustments. And then, uh, you know, really throughout a career it is. So I feel like I'm making those necessary ones right now and I'm learning. You also got babbipped in that start against the Red Sox. It needs to be said, <laughs> you know, it, everybody knows it. That was the, the first call. It is exactly that. It was like, Oh really? This one that got through. Okay, fine. Whatever. Um, so what's the focus then been for you this season? Has it just been that like command and you're trying to learn this role as a starter? Like I- I'm guessing that, last season was ma- like massively impactful for your confidence because you did come up and you did have incredible success at the major league level. So going down, it like probably doesn't feel as much of a like step back as with normal guys that get sent to the minors because it's not as though, you know, you had to tinker with that role. It's just about expanding it. What like, was that just it was improving the command on a mix of pitches? Yeah. I mean, like going back to starting too has been kind of an adjustment. I mean, you know, I, I hadn't gone, the amount of innings or pitches I have lately since 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a new ball game as well. Um, but yeah, last year, you know, I, I kind of got eased into it, which was really nice for my confidence. I mean, I, I ended the year pretty strong in 2019, came into spring. I felt like pretty flawlessly um, from that um, good ending. And then, uh, you know, like the season got canceled for a little bit or postponed and then came to summer camp ready to go and, and made an impression. And, uh, the season went really quickly, but, um, I looked up and all of a sudden, you know, we were in the playoffs and I was pitching and, um, you know, and a new role really. So, um, being a bullpen guy was completely new to me there too. So, but, um, being able to, you know, ease me into facing big league hitters, um, really helped a lot. Um, and then now this year, it's about going, you know, two, three times to an order. So mm-hmm. um, it's just constantly adjusting to the new uh, new demands. Yeah, and so far, again, the adjustments have gone really well. You've been cruising at the minor league level, and there's a reason why that you're on today, and there's a reason why you constantly have to be defending yourself um, or trying to not distract yourself when people who are frustrated with the Jays' bullpen are blowing up your phone is because you are having success. Like, it would be a completely different story if Thomas Hatch was gone down to the minor leagues. He was working out as a starter, and, uh, yeah, the numbers ballooned, and the ERA was high, and the pitch command was not very good. It has been a real success, and so... Uh, I'm guessing that at some point um, you will be with the plans. I know that for you, you said it, it's day-to-day, so you're just going to focus on what it is you're doing. But um, it would be very, very shocking, I think, to a lot of people if at some point this year you weren't uh, pitching leverage for, for this baseball team. And the other guy who's going to be doing that is down there with you, and it's why you know your name was everywhere too. It was, like, it was the two guys that everyone was so focused on pitching in the same game the other day. It's you and Nate Pearson. He's had this transition to relief pitching. You guys are kind of basically like flipping roles here in a way. I, I wonder if... 
I, like I just wonder in general like what your guys is communication is for somebody like that how Pearson who has been completely groomed as a starter moving to a bullpen role moving to something where there's less responsibility not knowing knowing that it's not writing off a guy's career or changing the outlook of his career that this is very much injury related but kind of being there as a teammate someone who has you know been in the big leagues someone who is now working as a starter trying to relay any type of advice to somebody like that who comes from a background of uh, insane um, work ethic and also just the amount of stuff that gets poured into his uh, his preparation, the data that he uses. What, what has it been like for Nate trying to make this transition to becoming a relief pitcher? You know, I think just with anybody else, you know, the, the situation is very fluid in this organization with, with the winning window that we're in. Um, I think he really just wants to contribute. And right now he sees that, you know, the organization sees that as a, as a reliever. And obviously he has unbelievable stuff. Um, I think, you know, in any capacity, he could help anybody out. So um, I think he's really excited. I know he's been just looking forward to getting healthy. And uh, now, you know, I think it's just beyond the horizon that he'll, he'll be able to get up there and help the team out. What's the... Um impact or the kind of communication from up top because you would have spent time uh working a lot with pete walker i'm guessing that he has had some impact on your career there's this weird thing where everybody seems to uh like pete is not overly there's not a ton of stories that we all seem to get him wrong in some regards but that he really does have this massive impact on guys and his coaching. There's a reason why the guy has been around as long as he's been around. Is he the guy that kind of starts to dictate some of your plans? Like, do you still end up having communication with him? Is this a certain area where you're mostly working with the staff that is in Buffalo and they're kind of getting some notes from up top? Like what, what is the actual um, process like when it comes to a plan for someone like you? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, it comes from upstairs, um, from the front office um, and our analytics department, um, and that's communicated through our coaching staff here. But obviously up there, it's communicated through Pete or Bushman, who's our bullpen coach, um, which everything's been spot on ever since I came here. I mean, I've made the adjustments I've, you know, they've told me, and ultimately they've been successful every time. So um, this year the focus was mainly on, you know, pounding the zone, um, you know, at times I can get um, away from my stuff a little bit and get a little bit timid, which is where I fall into traps. But, um, you know, I felt like I've made a big stride ever since I've come down for the past few starts, a pound in the zone, um, trusting my stuff. Um, and ultimately it's, it's uh, provided some success. Hey, man, uh, it absolutely has, and we continue to wish you the best. And I, I think that we will be seeing you here fairly soon. And uh, what role that's in, who knows? But I, I think that there will be one for you for a long time here in Toronto. Thomas Hatch, thanks for making time to everybody. Thank you for having me. See you, man. It's Thomas Hatch, Bison starter. And I'm glad. I'm glad that so many people let him know. I still think he'll be an important piece of this team. And, and I wonder what that date is where they look at it and go, okay, you're now a long man in this bullpen. We're not going to mess with the starting stuff for this long, but like he said, it's all fluid. If it's fluid for Nate Pearson, I think it can be fluid for Thomas Hatch. And he's taken a lot of strides this year. I mentioned it. Go look at the minor league numbers. He's been terrific in 11 outings. It's only 11 outings because of that injury, but it seems like that's behind him. He's got his sinker back. He's got a coaching staff that is obviously incredibly effective who have his trust, as you just heard. And I would just imagine that changing things for him will not be as difficult as it is for others. But at this point, like, I do feel as though the one good thing about this bullpen is that there is reason to believe in massive optimism. Ben and I talked about the regression to the mean when it comes to the likes of Simber and Richards, but there still is. Sori is going to come back. Meza, we got amazing news on him yesterday that he's really going to come off the IL as soon as possible, that it's really nothing major, that he should be fine, and he has had a good season. Meza's been one of the more overlooked guys in the pen this year. 
It's one of those you don't know what you have until it's gone scenarios where all of a sudden he's injured and everyone says, man, Mesa was actually a little bit more important than we thought. But that you could end up getting back Soria, Mesa, inject Pearson. I, I have trouble still putting Merriweather in the conversation just because of the injuries and the up and down nature of his news cycles. How weird it is that whenever you ask insiders about him, that they that the answers are never really clear, and that there's like a hesitancy to really say much. Just such a weird arm, and like someone who's been injured a lot in his career, and who's also changed so much about his delivery and his mechanics, and I I don't know I I. Y- I I still will always hold out hope that Merriweather can be a part of this bullpen, but it's not super promising when it's August 16th and the year has gone the way that it has. But Hatch... Hatch could just be huge for this team. You look at who comes in in long relief right now. It was the story about Stripling, right? Was that he was supposed to eventually move and become the swingman. And they have Trent Thornton in that role sometimes. And I think Sacedo has been good, but he's not a long man. It's just somebody who comes in in the middle of games. But they really haven't had a great option. And now we've discussed it. They're really in range of you got to win a bunch of games. You got to get hot. You got to play 625, 650 ball the rest of the way here. You've got to pound some bad teams into dust. So when are you just starting to pull the trigger and emptying the farm and and saying, you know what, no more of this having some of the better players on the team down here. We've got to make sure that it's as full as it can be. I've got to imagine that's getting pretty close for both Hatch and and for Pearson. Pearson's different because you need to see him in more roles. Um, I think Buck mentioned it on the broadcast that you need to see him in back-to-back days. You need to see him in some different roles to see how he's feeling, how he's doing, and then he ends up getting the call up. You're, you're not going to rush him this time after you rushed him already as a start of the season. But either way, um, if that really is the one thing that is holding this team back, then no area of the team is getting more help. Got to feel good about that. When we come back, Dan Shulman, got to feel good about that. It's going to... I need to address some things with Dan. And then, speaking of Buck Mar- Martinez... I have a just spectacular run of celebrity interactions for you. One of them involving Buck. Again, follow on Twitter and on Instagram at JD Bunker. Shoot me a note. We'll talk to Dan Shulman next. Good show. Sports Night 5 9 of the Fan. It's Good Show. Sports Night 5 9 of the Fan. I'm JD Bunkus. Going to be joined by somewhat of a celebrity himself. Dan Shulman, voice of the Blue Jays. What's up? I am not a celebrity. Okay. I'm a quasi-celebrity. That's how that's yeah, what it okay. says on my business card. Sure, okay. We can both agree <laughs> that if people have if people go, oh my God, that's Dan Shulman, then it counts, right? Like, I don't know if you've heard any of the show today, but um Annis ran into Nick Nurse at the airport and embarrassed himself. Um, oh jeez. On his ret- yeah, I know. And yeah. I thought it was the worst because if you're in this business, the one thing you're supposed to be able to do is not freeze or not clam up or not, you know, be uncomfortable in a situation like that. It's just Nick Nurse. Yeah. Ben has spoken with Nick Nurse multiple times. Right. And yet he sees him out in the wild and he freezes his knees buckle, he throws up on his shirt and he goes to the back of a line and listens to Nick Nurse. Doesn't say anything back to him, right? Um, I have been taking... I have been soliciting people's celebrity interaction stories today. They're awkward ones. Some people have sent me ones where they're cool in it, and I don't, I'm don't. i not going to read those. But I thought I would share this one with you because it has to do with your partner. Okay. Okay. Only, only if I get to share an awkward one that I had of with course. you. That was real. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, of course, of course, of course. Michael Ricci. 
He writes in and says, my best friend was lubed up from a Jays game. We head over to Harbor 60. So Michael's got some money uh, for a dinner party. We went to the bathroom, and in this bathroom, uh, I was slightly inebri- – there was Buck Martinez. My friend says hi and starts to approach for a handshake, proceeds to slip on the wet floor and tackle <laughs> Buck to the ground in which his son had to pick up both Buck and my friend. They shook it off and had a beverage together. It was beautiful. Wow, Buck Martinez, good guy, gets wow. tackled in a bathroom and has a drink with a guy. Wow, does that sound like the Buck you know? Yeah, no, that could be the Buck okay. I know. That's that. Yeah, <laughs> no, he's great with people, but you know, yeah. they. I mean, you, you don't talk to people in the bathroom. Like everybody knows know. that. That's not. That's I not. Know. That's as you know, strict and unwritten rule as there yeah. exists on this planet. Handshake so, in the bathroom, Dan. Nothing. Not even just a hello. Handshake. No, if if I yeah. saw like you know the best man at my wedding in the bathroom, I would I ignore him until yeah. we got out in the hall. So, wow, yeah. uh, that's, that's bad. That's a really bad one. There are some yeah. really, really. There have been some bad ones today. Um, trying to shake somebody's hand in the bathroom, like I've been trying to dole out advice, not as though I should be the one giving it, considering I've had a million awkward in, uh, interactions <laughs> with people too. But I think that my awkward interaction level is actually what makes me uniquely qualified to do a show like this. Where I'm like, hey, here's how you should actually do it. You know, like it's like you go get the relationship advice from a person who has bad relationships right. because they're the one who's played out the most scenarios. You don't go to the person with the good relationship. They're right. like, everything's so easy. You just have yeah. to love them deeply. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, what? <laughs> no, yeah, like no, I've, not... you know, all those expressions, 40s, the new 30, whatever, all that. Yeah. You're like aw- awkward is the new cool man like i like yeah. i'm all in on awkward <laughs> i specialize in awkward so it's yeah. a, it's all good let, let me give you mine real quickly so i Absolutely. i'm in chicago doing a game some game i don't remember and, and we're staying at a hotel and i go down uh i don't know why but I, I was on my own like nobody else from work was there so i went down and just was having a like an appetizer and a beer in the bar and alan iverson walks into the bar and it was one of those he was playing or something you know one of those tournaments you would know what it is i don't even know what it is but one of those tournaments that they had going a couple of years ago in the summer one of those tours and he was playing or he owned or coaching Probably or whatever he was doing he's sitting by himself eight feet from me the first espn game i ever did in my life 1995 was a georgetown game it was alan iverson's freshman season it was his wow. first ever basketball game i did georgetown um colgate and then georgetown temple the first two games i did so i remember them so i'm sitting there saying like it's Alan Iverson. And, and then after a while, I said, what the hell? So I walked over to him and I said, Alan, and he kind of looked right away, like he looks up with me with that look. And I said, hey, I'm sorry to bug you. I just, <laughs> I just thought it was kind of cool. Like I'm, I'm Dan Shulman. I did a bunch of your games with Vital at ESPN. And, and I did your first two games at, at Georgetown. And he loves Georgetown. Like I know that. Yeah. Uh, Colgate and Temple, I said, like it's a really fond memory of mine. And, and I just wanted to say hi. And he said, I never played Colgate and Temple. And I said, yeah, those were your first two games. And he goes, I never played Colgate and Temple. So I say, okay, sorry to bother you. And I walk away, and I pay my bill, and I go upstairs, and I Google. And he played Colgate and Temple. It was his first two games. And he, <laughs> I mean, he couldn't have wanted to get rid of me more. And, like, I wasn't going to sit down and buy him a beer or anything. And, and But, like, I, and I, that, so after that, like, I got to be, I got to feel really good about myself before I go up to you and say hi. Because um, he put me in my place pretty good. <laughs> no, you know what though? That's just one where you did you did the right thing. Like you're Dan, th- this you're Dan Shulman, and that is a cool story. That's just I, I I'm chucking this up as a one off. Like that's Allen Iverson, right? Like the Allen right. Iverson's famous most recent interview is viral for all the wrong reasons, right? right? Like I just think he's that level of fame, Dan, where he just can't even relate to another human being, and every person he sees, like he couldn't have filtered you out from me. You know, but, but, like but me I bet going you up to Allen been, Iverson. Right. But it, I bet you if it had been, you know, Ray Allen, he'd have been sure because nice, he's Ray. Yeah. Allen, right. Yeah, so it's I, it's I've spear. chalked it up. You know, I went to therapy. I've chalked it up to it. Yeah. It, 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 <laughs> it, it. You know, it, it was him, not me. You know, it's not the, yeah. one of those. It's not you. It's me. It's not me. It's you. It was yeah. you, Alan. So, yeah, I'm OK Man. with it now. So I actually <laughs> think that that's really like Allen Iverson is that level of famous where tall Dan Shulman, real tall, comes up with that voice 
says that story and you still are like, get out of my face is just a, yeah. it's a real testament to how famous that guy is. <laughs> like, yeah. Really? Yeah. That is yeah. overall that. That's could, not even, awkward. that's like, less. I kind of think you're cool from that story. I gotta say, I think that's a cool story for you. <laughs> you're like, hey, it's, it's, it's kind of a big flex. So yeah. uh, I'm going to let you flex one more time here and it's probably going to happen um, throughout time before we talk about the Blue Jays. I'm I'm at the point where so you sent me a text the other day about Rowdy and and I just I can't even look at it and my friend so the other day this is a true story my friend the other day we, he and I are driving somewhere and he looks at me and he goes have have you seen what Rowdy's doing and I'm like I I I told him I can't talk about it <laughs> so I can't talk about it. because it's not only that he's doing this he's doing everything that the Blue Jays ever needed him to be it's that. I'm looking the most wrong on something. Like, it's the double, you know? It's not like, oh, they lost this guy and I was a believer. It's like, I called him repeatedly not a major league player, and now he's, like, got an OPS of 1,000 since he's joined yeah. the Brewers. I don't know how to rec- – and, and you were the guy who's been saying, like, Rowdy's a player. you got to give Rowdy another shot. Keep going with Rowdy. And I mocked you. <laughs> this hurts. This is – I don't know what to do. Did you mock me to my face or did you mock me yes. behind my back? Oh, to your face, openly, okay. multiple times on the show. Like, yeah. every time that he came up. Yeah, I said so, you were the only one on Rowdy Island. I know. I, I remember, and, and I'm I'm not the kind of guy to go look for an old tweet, and I don't even know how to find an old tweet oh, and that's, retweet. That's so, good. thank God. I need, yeah, I need, maybe I need to, but I'm not that I'm not that kind of guy to put no one do it for Dan. Right by the way, here. that's not what he's asking. He's not asking for anyone to do it for him. Is also no, no, no. I don't. No, no, no. Here. Yeah, but yeah. I remember, like in March, saying like I'm mm. I'm buying Rowdy Inc. or whatever. Like I I, I was all in. I, I'm. So I don't know if you remember what you said to me the last time we talked about him. You you mm-hmm. you went like being John Malkovich, and you said like I wish I could get in your head and see what you see because <laughs> I don't see what you see. Yeah. So I thought the three weeks or whatever it was last year was not a hot streak. Like and, and you know you've had your Randall Grichik moments too, right? So oh, yeah. I, I by the way I'm having them again right now. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> so you know like I. To me, you know, Randall has hot streaks and Randall has cold streaks, but I think at the end of the day, Randall's Randall. Like, there's enough evidence to suggest Randall's Randall, right? And and he'll hit 25 or 30 homers, he'll hit 250, he'll have like a 750 OPS, whatever it is. But when I watched Rowdy, and Buck and I talked about it like every day last year, we we saw like a breakthrough. We didn't think it was a hot streak. It wasn't, oh, they made mistakes and he hit him out of the ballpark. And I know there was a Buffalo narrative, too, that he was doing great there. But we saw 10 pitch at bats and, and hard hit balls to left center. And we saw him fouling off pitchers' pitches and eventually getting to the mistake pitch. And I bought in. I, I just bought in. And, and once I bought in, I, you, you know, you can't sell as soon as he goes through a cold streak. So I think he was a victim. Oh, a victim maybe is the wrong word. But, I, 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 yeah, I think he was a victim of a few things. He got off to a, a cold start, obviously. They had one guy too many. You know, as soon as they got George Springer, they had ten guys for nine spots. And we all talked about that ad nauseum. So right away, his playing time was a little bit in peril. And, and I think what hurt him, too, was Vladdy having to move to first base. Because it, it, yeah. if Vladdy stays at third, Rowdy's got two spots, first base or DH. As soon as Vladdy moves to first, all he can do is DH. And if he doesn't hit, they're going to find somebody else. And, and I, I'm not blaming them. Like, it's one of those it is what it is kind of things. And he had run out of runway with the Blue Jays. There was nowhere for him to go, right? And yeah. um but I think this was always and, and listen, we could talk in a month and he could be hitting no eighty two over the next month, but I, I don't think so. I I think he's a legitimate major league player. I I, I don't think he's ever gonna be a three hundred hitter over a course of a full season. But I, I know what I said to you on the air last time. If he turned into a two fifty, thirty five homer a year guy, I would not be surprised at all. And well- you know, and and left-handed bat too, right? And, and and again, I'm not blaming the Blue Jays. There was nowhere else for him to go, given the current roster with Vladdy at first and four outfielders. And I know Springer was hurt a lot early, so there were. I know Rowdy got chances. I'm not saying he didn't got ch- didn't get chances. He did not hit well. Like I totally get that. But maybe he was like, man, if I don't get two hits today, I don't play tomorrow. Maybe that was in his head, and that's not in his head in Milwaukee. They gave him the job because they desperately needed a guy, uh, and maybe that just relaxed him and allowed them to hit. It's just one of those it is what it is kind of things, but I think this was always uh, a possibility when when he got moved to another team. Did he get traded before or after the Miami trade? Do you remember that? 
Richards was before Simber, I think. Okay, right? so I then, believe yeah. so. Yeah, because I was going to say that it it does. I would say that you're right. It's hard to blame the Blue Jays for this one. It's easy to blame me. Like I, everyone can blame me because uh, I. I was too harsh on a guy who still has an OPS plus of 102 as a Blue Jay over the course of four years and right. over 760 plate appearances. At times, I made him seem like, you know, he was a complete net negative when in reality his 2021 was quite bad and the rest of it was, hey, there's some real indications here that this guy can string it together. There was nothing overwhelming like what we're seeing right now. But there were some stretches where he was hot. There were some stretches where he was good. But I was going to say it is worse if they had made the Simber Dickerson trade before this and they identified, you know, Dickerson as the upgrade and the lefty bat that they wanted. Because all of a sudden you can really see the path for Rowdy a little bit more as Vlad is, I don't know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say battling fatigue, but maybe. And it's hard not to say something about it. Even as he's starting to draw walks and get some hits. Vladdy hasn't been the same guy at the plate. Ben pointed it out that since, you know, August 16th, he's got, or since August, it's now 16 days, he's got two extra base hits. That's not MVP Vlad by any stretch of the imagination. I'd rather have Rowdy at first base right now than Gurriel as a substitution, especially like considering the differences between the two guys. Yep. And yeah, BGO, since going down, there has been more of a need for that lefty bat. And Dickerson just hit his first home run as a J. So. Um, it's a tough one to swallow. And, and I got to say yep. that, like, yeah, you're right in that he's probably not going to hit 300. Like, what is he? He's hitting 333 as a brewer. Oof, yeah. just pain. Um, OPS over 1,000. But, yeah, these, these are the kind of numbers that if you combine them with all of his big league level stuff, show that he is an above average player. And that's a guy that doesn't provide defense, which means that the bat is probably for real. Oof. Yeah, and, and again, I, I'm not blaming anybody. Like, like yeah. he didn't hit. He did have some opportunity. I'm looking at his baseball yeah, record right now. So mm-hmm. he he had 139 at bats with the Blue Jays this year. But yeah. it wouldn't shock me if you gave him, you know, if you gave him some truth to serum. If he said, "I felt like I had to get two hits in order to play yeah. the next day because there were ten guys for nine spots." Like depth is great, but not everybody reacts to it the same way. You know, like I think if Randall's, if Gritchick sits once or twice a week, I don't think it's going to mess with his head. And I'm not saying it messed with Rowdy's head, but I wouldn't be shocked if there was something yeah. there. And he, he probably felt some pressure to hit right away. So I'm not blaming anybody, but I think this was always a possibility. And I'll tell you why I think it's real. Um, he's played 30 games for Milwaukee. He has struck out 11 times. And that's mm-hmm. what he was doing last year when he got hot he was not striking out he wasn't afraid to hit with two strikes but he wasn't striking out very much and and um i think and and i know other people that i know on other teams and stuff like that they they think he's real and i think he's real too um but this is a strange trade in that i think from a blue jay perspective you almost have to evaluate it exclusively on what richards does there's no point in looking at what rowdy does because again He'd hit a wall. There was, there was nowhere for him to go in this organization unless they were going to trade somebody else. But even if they traded somebody else, we know that Charlie and I think the front office, too, love rotating guys through the DH spot. They were going to put Springer there sometimes. They were going to put Vlad there sometimes, which was okay when they put Vlad there. But if they put Springer or Hernandez or Guriel or Bichette or any of those guys at the DH spot, Rowdy can't play. So what were you going to do with him? So I, I, I think it's unfortunate because I think he is a major league player. But the only way, in my mind, for him to have stayed really viable with the Blue Jays is if Laddie had been able to stay at third. Yeah. And when we're looking at fault and all these things, it, it is also important to note that he was traded for someone who – if we're just doing this based on a war evaluation, right? Like who is actually given the Blue Jays more value to this team this year? I would argue that Trevor Richards has still done that. That like Rowdy Telez in his current role with the Blue Jays doesn't give them as much as Trevor Richards has given them. Like he's been unbelievably important. They've had no reliable arms in the pen and Trevor Richards right. has been one of those arms. Yeah. And he's 28 years old with 3 years, I think 3 years left of control. Like he's arbitration yes. eligible this year, but still it's like they decide the future of Trevor Richards. So like, these things do matter when we say, hey, they gave up on something. No doubt, if the, like, let's put it this way. If the Blue Jays tried to remake that trade, if they were like, hey, let's do a redo, the, the Brewers would be the ones who say no. But I, I still look at it and say, hey, at least they didn't trade Rowdy away, and it was, a, it was for somebody that was a futures or a cash right. dump, or yep. they actually did get something for him. Um, so that's super important. Um, well, absolutely. The bullpen was drowning at the time, like yes. drowning. So they, they absolutely had to go out and get relievers. So, yeah. 
uh, yeah, that's why I say there's no point in looking at this trade on the basis of what Rowdy does. All that matters yeah. is uh, what Richards does for this team. Totally. So I, I asked Ben this question earlier, and I don't know if I'm just overreacting or if it's a, you know, just uh, like I can't tell if this is smart or stupid. I really can't. But I, I, I equated the analogy to, you know, when you're watching a basketball game and a team is down 10 to 12 points and they keep going on these little mini runs and they close the gap to four, they close the gap to six, but there seems to be this invisible line where they just can't get over it. And you're watching it and you're thinking, man, if they can just hit a three now and close it to one, they're going to win this ball game. They've been better for a lot of stretches, but they just can't get the stop when they need it or the bucket when they need it. And I'm sort of getting that feel with the Blue Jays right now, where they're four and a half games back of the second wild card. They were just incredibly hot at home. And road trips are very difficult. And they were one win away from a bad call potentially at home plate where this is maybe even flipped and we're talking about how well they've done. But do you believe that there is something about this team that is kind of like this unquantifiable thing or this thing that we haven't touched on that is sneakily holding them back just a little bit because we know the bullpen is bad, right? And we know we can point to things like injuries to Springer and say that really hurt them throughout the course of the season. We're sort of looking at the Vlad thing now and saying this could be really hurting them. Vlad and Bo, I should put them together as with the fatigue thing. But I can't quite put, there's this, not to sound like a douche, but a je ne sais quoi that I can't get over with this team where like they get to these spots and then there's always like a bit of a mini step back and, and I'm they're in the zone now where they can't have that anymore. Yeah, so well, they're in the zone where they can't have that anymore is the is the first thing. So yeah, you, your last thing is the first thing. They they they're four and a half back with forty five to go. Right. Um, so that's you know that's not nothing. It's it's not uh, insurmountable, but it's not nothing. I don't think there's any you know hidden mystical thing that's keeping them back. No, I no, think I'm there not, are just this is some game situation. That I'm not trying to. Pardon agree me. To. I said I'm not trying to allude to this being like a Joe Boo situation. Yeah, yeah. Like so, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I, I just think there there are you know at times the bullpen's not good enough, and at times mm-hmm. they don't hit enough late you know in late close games, which has become a sad you know an, uh, um, an area we've all become very familiar with as it's gotten a lot of notoriety the last week or so around this team, and uh, like that first game in Seattle. Um, Simeon doubles. I know it was, it was scored a single, but Simeon doubles, but a pop-up slide. His foot comes off the bag for an eighth of a second. Toro tags him. He's out. Then the next three guys go like single, double, single, or something like that. It costs them a run. They, if that doesn't happen and you retrace the inning, you, you win the game. Uh, the Valera decision to go and whether he was tagged or not, like that game could have been won four or five different times by the Blue Jays, and, and it wasn't. So... Um, I, I just think at some big moments in games, close games, they're just not playing well enough. I, I don't think it's anything bigger than that. I don't think there's any reason they can't do it. They just haven't done it. And it could be a base running play. It could be leaving too many men on base. It could be the bullpen. It could be any one of a number of different things. So, like, like if I said to you now, everybody zero and zero, evaluate the American League on the basis of talent, I think they're like the third most talented team in the league. Like, the the White Sox are really good. And I think Houston is really good, really good. Um, are, do the Rays, and the Rays are, you know, the Rays are on an, old, uh, on an island all to themselves, right, when we talk about this, because the whole is greater than the sum of the parts with the Rays. The whole has not been as much, as good as the sum of the parts for the Blue Jays. They should be better. They should have won more games. And, and a lot of times it's been the bullpen. Sometimes it hasn't been. Uh, hitting in late and close games. There's no reason they can't win run one games, one run games. Excuse me. They just haven't done it as much as they've needed to do it, and they've given some games away. So um, I, I just think it's they got to play better. You know, the run differential is great. Winning games, thirteen to one's fun and all that. But they got to they've got to do better in the close games. And, and again, they can, but they've just got to get better uh, better relief work and, and and a little bit better hitting seventh inning on in close games and all that. And 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 then they can do it. They they are talented enough to make a real run at the playoffs. They just got to play better when it matters the most. Yeah, that's that's kind of how I feel about it too. It's just always. It's always really hard to discuss baseball teams that way. You know, like the relief pitching part of it is obvious. The relief pitching part is like, yeah, these guys are not doing their jobs well enough. And some people put that on the manager at times when I think it's ridiculous. Um, 
where people get mad at Charlie Montoyo when he runs out these subpar relief pitchers, and it's like, what do you want him to do? He's only got so many of them, and they can't pitch every single day. Like, they've already run into some injuries with Mesa, and they got Soria that gets, uh, you know, IL'd right away. They're already missing a ton of guys that were supposed to be the back end of this bullpen. So ultimately, to me, it's a, hey, those guys have to do their job. So that part of it is obvious. I just... This is the one that's tough. Is there something, you know, with baseball players, especially hitters, where you develop these reps? Like, you develop these, um, this ability to hit in those close games where it doesn't change who you are and it's part of this part of the season where it is August where you are feeling that bit of fatigue and you can stay locked in and you can still be the player that you are earlier in the season. It's like, I feel as though... A lot of the sport, with all the, the math component, would tell you, like, no, that's not really what this is. This is some type of confirmation bias that you're working off of. But when I watch them, and this continues to happen in kind of this way, it does feel like the untold story is that, yes, the relief pitching hasn't been great, but also the bats have come up short in a lot of these spots. But why would it just afflict them and not the Mariners and the Red Sox and the I A's? And the, you know what I mean? So that that's I why I would say, no, I don't think so. And, and, you know, as has been pointed out, and I've seen it, like one-run games, like the Dodgers are probably still the best team in baseball and the defending World Series champions, and they, they've got a bad record in one-run games, too. Like, it's there is a little bit, uh, maybe more than a little bit, of a random nature to these kinds of things. So, uh, And sometimes it's not how much you hit it's when you hit like in the first two games of the series against seattle i think the blue jays i can't remember the number but they out hit the well, like 17 to 10 or something like that in the two games and they lost they lost both games because they went two for 17 with runners in scoring position and seattle went like four for eight but that doesn't mean the next day that they wouldn't go four for eight and the mariners wouldn't go one for seven so i don't think there's any reason they're they're not doing it as much as you'd think they would i, I just think they haven't and i think they'll be fine and and there is some you know like derek jeter was always perceived as this amazing clutch player and i think his you know his late and close and clutch numbers were all actually very similar to what he did through his whole career so sometimes there is a little bit of, of perception over reality um in this kind of thing but uh, again I, I don't think there's anything holding them back they've just got to do better and and uh, and the bullpen to me is still at least as big a part of this you know even if you look at the current bullpen like they just don't have enough guys to throw three guys out there one day to help them win a game and then three other trustworthy guys out there the next day to help them win another game they just don't have that yet if Mesa, if soria if pearson you know then okay then now now it's a little bit different but um they're they're trying to squeeze everything they can out of the bullpen and i know you talked about in two thomas hatch you know i think he's a part of this as well so like in the next week or two i'm expecting to see three maybe four pitching moves if not when the rosters expand even though they only expand by two now but you know by on the first of by the first of september uh, i would hope and expect to see Mesa, soria hatch and pearson all on the roster they only expand by two? I didn't know that. <laughs> it, uh, that was a – I don't know if that was a pre-pandemic and it just happened or if it's – like you used to be able to go to 40. Now yeah. I, I think you can only go to 28 if I'm not mistaken. So it, like um, – and huh. another thing to keep in mind is the minor league season always typically ends on Labor Day. So there used to be a – well, he can't pitch anymore, so we may as well bring him up, and we got 40 yeah. spots. The minor league season started late this year because of yeah, COVID. It is ending late. It is going right yeah. through September. So – you know, the Hatch one, I feel for Thomas Hatch. I mean, he's had some injuries, and he's been like the ultimate insurance policy. Like, we need him to do that in case we need him to do this. Um, but it's getting late. There are only 45 games left, and he is certainly one of the 14 best pitchers they have. Um, and, and I think there's a role for him. And, and if one of the starters got hurt and then he went into the rotation and he could only give you three, four innings, then – you figure it out, and you build them up a little bit slowly there. But um, there, are, you know, if you look at the current staff, you can find a spot for three or four of those guys. They're, yeah. you know, they're better than some of the guys they've got on the staff now. And for this team to get a winning streak together, there are only two ways to do it. They got to score like crazy, so it doesn't matter if the if the you know the B guys in the bullpen gives up some runs every now and again, or you need a, a better bullpen than you've got right now. And and Mesa coming back would be great, but they need help on the right side because like mm -hmm. they're playing the white. Sox soon, heavy right-handed team. They're playing the Yankees, heavy right-hand hitting team, even with Gallo and Rizzo on the roster. They they need righties because, uh, you know, we see how 
how the Blue Jays operate, um, you know, heavy left-right bias and, and that sort of thing. So they've got Simber and Richards and Romano, but and, and not that Sori is a savior, but he can help. Pearson, obviously, if, 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 we've talked about all the ifs, if everything goes well, he could clearly help, and Thomas Hatch could help too. Like Thomas Hatch could be that guy, you know, Mats has a night like last night, the pitch count's really high, he only goes five. Uh, you know, you're up six to one. Roll Thomas Hatch out there for three innings. You know, he can he can be that guy. So um, I, I would hope to see a number of changes in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I just had Hatch on, and we talked a little bit about his year. But the guy feels healthy. He's throwing great in the minors. Like his ERA is barely over three. And yeah, I just I mentioned the idea of how it can be frustrating looking at the major league roster and seeing how. They need him. <laughs> he's down in the minor leagues, and he has to stay focused on what it is that he's doing. But he kept reiterating the same thing over and over again, which is that he's ready to do whatever they need him to do. Yeah. And um, reading between the lines to me, that's like, this guy knows he's going to be here eventually. This guy knows he's going to be playing a big part of it. And to me, it's like we do all the ifs, you know, if Merriweather can get healthy, if Soria can be old. So- like To me, Thomas Hatch has the least amount of ifs. Where uh-huh. if he just comes up, I'm penciling him in for the role you just outlined, and I, I truly believe that it's going to work. I, I just think that he's going to be here. And that's the other good thing, though, too, is that it's one thing to have ifs, but when you have that many, it's hard to imagine the Blue Jays not hitting on – like how many of those did we just list? Six? Six ifs? Uh, well, Five I, I, ifs? I didn't put Merriweather. So I, so, I had yeah. Mesa, Soria, yeah. Pearson, and Hatch. So I had four. Hatch. So, yeah. yeah, so five, we, exactly. Nobody's doing Merriweather again, which is scary. So Merriweather, it's one week we're like, Merriweather is coming back. And then the next week it's, don't even mention Merriweather. He's yeah. not existed. He's, uh, I, I, I can't remember anything quite like this. But anyway, yeah. um, that at least you got to imagine, if you could just hit on two of those five, that you're feeling so much better about the way that this bullpen is. And, yeah, just give them two of those five. Uh, I got one to go out with you on here with another celebrity story because it's a bathroom story. You want it? <laughs> sure. <laughs> How do I Thomas, say no to that? Yeah, Yeah, I know. Thomas, this one's... I think it's actually even better than the Buck one. Thomas wrote me, a buddy of mine saw Jay Cutler in a washroom in Chicago. <laughs> He's a huge Bears fan. When they were washing their hands, he told him how great he thought he was and how huge it was that the Bears finally have a good quarterback. <laughs> Jay Cutler turned to him and said, I don't bleeping care. <laughs> yes. Walked out. <laughs> yes, that that story I've heard, and there are a few of us at ESPN who are buddies, and if one of us will send another guy a text that's a little self-absorbed or whatever, you'll you'll get back. Uh, don't care with like eight A's in the care, and that's yeah. and that's Jay Cutler going. Don't care. That's always yeah. the tone that we say it to each <laughs> other with. So yeah, that story has made the rounds. That's a yeah. that's a good one, and it's even true. I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I love is that. And you know, how could you even be upset if you met someone like Jay Cutler who has the reputation of Jay Cutler, right? And then all of a sudden he's nice. I would feel as though in a weird way, I would be more disappointed. Like if Jay Cutler, if I meet him and he says, I don't bleeping care in my face and I have that one second of feeling awkward, but then the story of Jay Cutler to tell people that they're all going to believe because like (laughs) this person trying to tell the story of like, and I was washing my hands and I told Jay Cutler, I was a big bears fan. And he went, Oh man, that's so awesome. You know, you should come to my my house and we'll watch some tape sometime. (laughs) No, no, no one's ever going to believe you. Your story sucks. This is a much better story. So congratulations. Exactly. Exactly. It, it, It just reaffirms everything that you thought before you met him in the first place. So right. Like don't, approach Allen Iverson ever. Right. Don't approach it. Hey, let this, <laughs> let this be a lesson, everyone. If Dan Shulman talking about Allen Iverson's <laughs> earliest memories at Georgetown is not good enough as an in to talk to Allen Iverson, yeah. you don't have anything. No listen, pers- <laughs> but I had this shit. No, you'd have nothing. Just let it go. Let Allen yep. Iverson go by and take a picture yep. maybe as he's walking past you. Dan, thanks yep. for the time as always, man. Okay. All right. Talk to you again. See you, buddy. Dan Shulman. Voice of the Blue Jays. <laughs> He did the right thing. Sometimes, like, I, one of the other rules I would say is if you're not the server, don't approach the athlete in a restaurant. They're sitting at the bar. I think it's a little different. But if they're at a table, that's a 100% no-fly zone. If you're the server, you can say a thing. And some of your stories are awkward interactions as uh, 
servers. And uh, you struck out. You struck out a couple of times. That's okay. But uh, that one... <laughs> that one is justified. He's also a celebrity. Or a quasi-celebrity, if he wants to put it this way. I like this one from Matthew. He said, he met Donovan Bailey at Woodbine Racetrack, and the security guard didn't know who he was and made him go get his ID from the car. <laughs> That's bad. I... Oof. I think if you're that security guard, I'm not advocating for you to be fired. Everybody makes mistakes. But that guy is super fortunate that he did that to Donovan Bailey because Donovan Bailey is like a really nice guy who wouldn't kick up a storm but was fully within his rights to, his celebrity rights to. Whew. I love this one from James Bondy. My family stayed in the same hotel as the Chicago Bulls in Auburn Hills the year they knocked out the Pistons for the first time. I was 12 years old. Most of the team signed autographs when they arrived at the lobby. Finally, Michael Jordan got off the bus last and went directly into an open elevator. I ran right behind him, found myself squished up against his leg. I looked up and he looked down. The elevator door opened. Everyone stepped out and I said, Mr. Jordan, can I have your autograph? And he replied... <laughs> Get away from my room, kid. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Thanks for that one, James. That's a really good one. Again, that's awesome. That's such a better story to have with Michael Jordan than... And then he gave me an autograph. So lucky you, James. You got a real Michael Jordan interaction. You got a story that everyone believes. Like... If you gave me a Michael Jordan story, you're 12 years old and you remember this and he was nice and he gave you a high five, I wouldn't care. I care about that story though. So just remember those. Hey, sometimes when you have the awkward interaction, sometimes when it sucks, at least it turns into a cool story down the line that you get to tell people. And maybe that's worth it even more than some crummy autograph. When we come back, another celebrity, Nick Dika, bass player for the Arkells and contributor Fangraphs. They uh, had some shows that you might have seen people post on Instagram over the weekend talk about it next good show jd bunkers sports and five nine of the fan so if you opened up an app on your phone and you live in this country over the weekend you saw the arkells absolutely crushing it three nights in a row i was wonder how you know, like my voice gets tired from a couple of days, so I don't know how I guess Max does it with the singing. Like I'll t- I don't know what singers go through, but uh, Nick Dyka, bass player for the Arkells and contributor to Fangraphs, uh, someone I can chop up a little bit with the baseball, uh, joins me now. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Good, JD. How you doing? Good, man. Good. So first of all, let's just start with that. Like being back. Having that layoff, I think you guys were saying it on stage, something like 500 and some days, like a million days, unquantifiable yeah. amounts of days. Uh, just being off stage and then having that, that kind of a turnout, that kind of a response, those kind of events, like just the, how did you guys just not like cry the whole time? <laughs> yeah, you know what, like uh, there, there's definitely a couple of moments where if you, if you started thinking about it, that's, that's where it was going. So whenever, whenever that happened, I just tried to, to refocus myself um, because <laughs> as, as much as, you know, we're, we're, we're crying, not the, not a bad thing, but like oh. it's not a great show to see just five guys sobbing for two hours. So <laughs> <laughs> I just like to picture yeah. you going to the back before an encore and then just everybody having like a hard weep and then coming back yeah. out, like all just, you know, runny eyes, red eyes, just soaked. It's yeah. like, we're fine. It's all good. Yeah. I just, I know how emotional I got when I went to the first Blue Jays game, like, and even yeah. just like watching them on TV and being back mm-hmm. in a crowd and there's just, there's an energy that you can't replicate. Right. And yes. Yeah. Okay. You guys make music ultimately, you know, I would think I actually don't know really what your motivations are, but not necessarily just to be in a crowd or for that explicit purpose, but having that back, like I talked a lot about the pandemic, how something that I hoped that a lot of people took away from these things is that a job can be more than a job like it can be a sense of purpose and having these things yeah. that you love taken away from you for so long and then have it come back in this way when i'm sure you guys 
had doubts just like anybody else. Like when Fauci first came out with those reports about, hey, sports and stadiums, those aren't going to happen for years and years and years. And wondering what that was going to do to your business and the anxiety of not having touring when you guys have such a successful touring act in this country. Like having all of it just smack you as you're on that stage is just, yeah, it's it's incredible. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I know it's probably an overused word, but it, it's overwhelming, right? It's like you think of everything that's happened in the last two years and to, to, to be in a spot that felt normal and familiar. And, and like you said, like, you know, working in music, it, it, it's not punching a clock. It, it, does, it does mean a lot more than just kind of like a way to keep the lights on. And so when, when you lose that, you know, it, it, it really does kind of like, lead to a lot of lead to a lot of kind of like you you kind of lose your purpose and you you're, you're a little bit kind of lost and meandering like i'm sure a lot of people have been in the last two years and i mean that's totally if that's the worst problem you've had in the last two years you know mm-hmm. we consider ourselves very very lucky but yeah it felt very very good to to be back yeah and i just you know for you especially um you've got a band like this is canadian music so yeah. it's not like, you know, your Taylor Swift who's going to be fine with getting the Spotify streams. Although I'm sure your Spotify is fine. I'm sure you guys get, you know, yeah. some revenue from there. But still, like, yeah. touring is a huge part of the business model. <laughs> like, packing those people oh. into there is massive yeah. for the bottom line. And you also own a bar. So it's like you picked, like, yeah. the two worst pandemic businesses. You're like, well, hey, I got a yeah. bar and I got a <laughs> musical act that tours. What yeah. could go wrong? And then it's like, boom, this. Here you go. It's hilarious because, like, the reason part of the reason I started the bar was like, oh, you know, if like we do something where you know people can't tour, like you know, if they have young kids or you know Max yeah. blows out his voice or something, like, yeah. oh, well, I'll have the bar and I can kind of like work there for a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, so but that unfortunately was not the case. But you know, yeah, how you can't plan for these things. You you really can't. No, and I, I will say that. So there is something cool. Like, you guys get back to doing what you do, and people show up the way that they show up, and it's awesome. Yeah. Um, I heard some stories of a lot of people on the lawn, you know, having a time. <laughs> Let's just say, like, yeah. there was a, there was some ejections on the lawn, you may have heard, that yeah. uh, some, yeah. some people were like, oh, we're back in a crowd? Okay, I'm going to act this way. But it was yeah. just like the Blue Jays, and it's something that I've talked about a lot with people, you know, over the summer as things have started to come back, yeah. is just the importance of this and that it's more than just – um, sometimes people just boil things down to entertainment as something that is unnecessary, not unnecessary, yeah. but not essential. Right. And saying like, yeah. well, why would we ever do this for the risk? And why would we ever do that? And if you just look at the people who have been down to the Rogers center and now you talk to people who have now been to your shows of which I've had like already mm-hmm. a ton of conversations with just like the meaning of that to so many people and the fact that, yeah, you guys are at the forefront right now of something special and to create those yeah. memories for people and just like the euphoria from those shows and from the people that went and the sense of relief and community and all of these things that come through music. I actually think that yeah. you guys should be proud of the shows that you executed. And I hope that you guys, oh, uh, you. I'm sure you understand like the gravity of it all. Yeah. I mean, you know, community is, is so important and, the one of the things you know everything that covid brought was like you were isolated from mm-hmm. so many different communities you have so not you know not just like through music but through, you know there was times you couldn't see your family and mm-hmm. it's yeah to be to be able to like bring people together i think is is one of like a kind of the mo's of of our shows and how we try to like structure our performances and, and run the shows and and you know be very inclusive and celebrate like with everybody there and yeah, having that, you know, we, we were able to record and, and do all things like that, uh, you know, during the lockdowns. But to have everybody together is, is super meaningful. And, yeah, like, you know, I know Max went to the first Jays game. I went to one of the games against Boston. And, you know, mm-hmm. we felt that same energy there. And we honestly, we talked about, like, how do we, how do we replicate that or how do, we, how do we incorporate that into, you know, like a, a rock show. Uh, I think uh, you incorporated it just fine. So I also wanted to have you on today to talk about the Blue Jays because I imagine that the thoughts are starting to build. And I actually always wonder with uh, stuff like